no. All right. All right. So I'll just start with a very small introduction. So we have here um, Troy Bufour, who's the director of the Center for Arctic Security and Resilience at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks. So he's the designer and instructor for the Arctic Security Graduate Concentration and the Graduate Certificate in the Masters of Security and Disaster Management Program. So his fields of study are Arctic security and currently, if I'm not mistaken, the Russian Federation Arctic Defense and International Strategy. So I'll leave uh, the stage up to you, Troy. Okay, hey, thanks. Good morning, good afternoon uh, to everyone, and thanks for having me. Uh, I really enjoy these kind of discussions and how the ability to interact with others, even remotely, has really become um, a very positive thing. Uh, and especially as travel is, is always not so easy. Uh, I always welcome these opportunities, so thank you for this. Um, <clears throat> So as, as Layla Marie said, uh, my name is Troy Buford. I'm up here in Fairbanks, Alaska. I retired uh, from the military here in uh, 2010, uh, not to date myself, but there you go. And um, it was with the uh, then Striker Brigade Combat Team here at Fort Wayne Wright. And uh, things have really changed up there, um, but I'll talk about that in, in, in a bit. I. Uh, I got out and didn't quite know what I was going to do. I didn't do like a lot of my colleagues who went right back to work on base. They just changed clothes and there they are and they're enjoying it. And I get to see them every once in a while. I kind of went in a different direction for no particular reason other than, hey, there's a huge world out there. Let's see what that is. Uh, and I got involved in, in um, you know, semi high level politics when I was a chief of staff at the uh, Alaska legislature in Juneau, which was an experience. And it really accelerated my learning about Alaska, which was what I really wanted. However, I could not stand the politics. Um, it, it wasn't for me. So I got away from there um, after a bit and, and landed in academia. And shortly thereafter, <clears throat> my uh, current boss, Dr. Carlson, who's now our dean, uh, uh, asked me if I wanted to stay on full time and, and teach in this program. Uh, uh, Homeland Security Emergency Management. I'm like, all right, it's not exactly my thing, but I'll adapt. <laughs> as long as there's this like Arctic piece I can do, he's like, got a deal for you. And uh, ever since then, that's kind of what I've carried. And it's it was <clears throat> not unlike what my university, University of Alaska Fairbanks here was sort of experiencing. When I took this on, nobody really, really cared about the Arctic that much. The discussion wasn't that active quite yet. Um, it was about to take off, but we, we've been invested in the Arctic for decades and decades. And I think to this date, we're still the most published academic institute in the world on Arctic sciences and cited. Um, and obviously we're gonna face competition there, but it just tells you, we've been doing this a long time when no one cared, now everyone does. And we're seeing amazing changes here and in interest because of it. And uh, I got into it the same way. I got this passion for Arctic security and I didn't see a lot of work on it, especially in the United States. So that's where I found a new purpose. I'm like, I'm going to take this thing on. I think I'm going to make it my thing, whatever this thing is, and go from there. And it didn't take a whole lot of time after about 2014, what we saw. Um, or back in, in 2007, we saw Russia plant that uh, titanium flag at the bottom of the Arctic Ocean, 2008, we get pretty authoritative um, scientific modeling being published on, on receding sea ice, and um, a very authoritative report from a former colleague of mine, who was the director of the USGS, uh, that published um, the estimated reserves on undiscovered, technically recoverable oil and gas in the Arctic. And from that point on, nothing's been the same in the Arctic. Right, starting with why did Russia plant that flag? And that just generated all kinds of neat discussion. Uh, and, and here we are. Um, things have really changed. Um, I'm going to pull up a slide real quick, if that's all right. Can I, if I can share these? Um, here we go. So I'm currently the uh, director of the Center for Arctic Security and Resilience here at UAF. Um, just started that out of out of sort of 
interest and want to fill this gap because uh, once once I started getting in contact and people were like, you know, you're kind of one of the only people studying this with this focus that you have, like this defense focus. Um, I'm like, oh, okay, well, just, we'll try to do better and grow the grow the network. Um, and and one of the first things I, I did was reach out uh, to my colleagues in Canada, you know, Dr. Lockenbauer and you know, Andre Sharon and Jim and Rob Hubert and, and and all of the usual suspects in in order to uh, develop maybe what would be parallel uh, to the North American Aerospace Defense Command NORAD, which is the Binational Defense Command uh, and dual command NORAD and U.S. NORTHCOM, commanded by General Van Herp right now, who wears both hats, who is in charge of the defense of the entire North American continent. Uh, and, you know, Andrea and I and some others and Heather, we were like, why aren't we studying and researching defense and security with that sort of construct also? Why aren't we, you know, we're doing lots of U.S. studies. We're doing lots of Canadian studies. We're not doing both the U.S. and Canada, Canada, U.S. Why not? Because there's a, a significant authority uh, that is legally required to do so. So why don't we start doing the same thing? And <clears throat> ever since then, we've been, there's very little we do now where I don't go, mm, what can I get from Canada to add to this conversation and vice versa? And it's just been phenomenal. And if you're familiar with our network, the North American Arctic Defense Security Network, it's it's been quite the journey. Um, so I've been working to, to be kind of the US lead on that side. Uh, and that's really developed um, nicely over the years. Uh, and we've gotten sort of the North American look in a decent place. And we've had to, you know, keep ourselves nicely grounded uh, on the European side, always looking at Russia. Um, and uh, as of this year, early this year, a lot of stuff has changed. And I think it's a good time to discuss this. Um, my center, we do a lot of stuff, right? I come, you know, from an operational background, obviously 22 years in the military, uh, so plenty of that with NATO. Um, and that, that, that taught me a lot. Uh, and at some combatant commands. <clears throat> and I'm still working uh, very closely with NORAD and U.S. NORTHCOM, one of the six geographic uh, combatant commands. Uh, and, and that one being here where the arctic is part of their strategic responsibilities and over 50 percent of their responsibilities right so we think automatically in terms of the arctic uh, quite a bit um and i speak that language right defense is a different language it's not just acronyms either and i'm going to show you one of the most prime examples of how that is and why right now i've gotten down to the tactical level so i mentioned uh that i used to work um and be a, I was assigned here locally at Fort Wainwright with the Striker Brigade, which uh, has changed as of May this year to the 11th Airborne Division. So it's been reactivated to the Arctic, the only Department of Defense unit that is assigned an Arctic mission that's ever been, right? So they're up and running since May, and I work very closely with um, <clears throat> former and the uh, current uh, commander, General Brian Eifler in terms of helping what is going to be a very, very significant uh, transformation. Because uh, not everybody realizes just because we've had units in Alaska, they've never had an Arctic mission. So everything they've done, all their equipment, all their training was not designed for that. Um, so literally starting from scratch, even though we've been here for decades and decades and decades. And I, I know what pain is involved with that and what challenges, difficulties, opportunities. Uh, so when this happened, I jumped in head first because this is really uh, kind of my passion being a former Army guy. Um, we're closely with uh, JTF North. Uh, General uh, Godbu is an amazing commander and his crew uh, and CJOC um, and helping Natson to uh, provide um, you know, all, the, all the value we, we can uh, at the speed of relevance, uh, led by uh, Dr. Lockenbauer, which has been just phenomenal. Um, 
I've uh, also been very fortunate early on, once I kind of started dabbling in this Arctic stuff, to get involved with the Arctic Council. And I've been part of the U.S. delegation uh, in the past and other uh, working groups, and I'm currently working on a project with the Arctic Council. So I've learned a lot about the diplomatic world, um, you know, in a modest level. Um, but you talk about a different language. That really shocked me. But that gave me amazing perspective and an education you just can't get anywhere uh, that I just I value. And I want to be able to share that uh, because it's important because defense thinking is different from foreign affairs thinking, but they got to work together and we know how important that is. I've been lucky to work with, you know, NATO organizations currently wrapping up a project with the NATO uh, Strategic Communication Center of Excellence. So they got uh, 20, I think, 20 centers of excellence now in NATO that provide the official information to the member states. And I've been active with them for about the last four years when they started working on Arctic stuff. And it's just been um, just a huge, huge rewarding uh, uh, experience for us. Working on some new stuff with RAND, which is uh, quite interesting um and it's, it's going to probably consume most of my time for the next couple of years um, but um couldn't ask for more so you know among other things so i've just sort of walked through how i've, I've, I've got a lot of uh, fortunate fortunate experience with defense organizations around the world and, I, and it's, that's a language uh and it's it's a little bit different i'm going to give you an example here in a bit I've had uh, amazing uh, and modest uh, experience with foreign affairs authorities. And that is wildly different. And the way they think and helping to bridge the two has been huge. And obviously up here at the at the university, I also speak research, which as we know, academia is a whole different language. And these are three major institutions on this planet at any given time that don't necessarily know how to talk to each other. So a lot of fun for me and value uh, has been helping each other, uh, these organizations talk to each other, bringing them together uh, and, and facilitating. And it's it's been just one of the most rewarding things I've ever done. Um, so I'm gonna focus on two things, but I'm, I'm happy to get a ton of, of questions um, on any of the stuff I just mentioned. And first thing will be what we need to, start thinking about in terms of what, what's gone uh, from uh, years of cooperation in the Arctic to now competition, um, more distinctly anyhow. And then how defense thinks about climate change impacts. It might not be what you think. All right. So for the Department of Defense, we look at the conflict continuum, but it's all inclusive. And you'll notice here, we're talking about cooperation, competition, and conflict slash war. And these are the three states that any location region uh, is, is in naturally. Naturally, usually we're in a state of competition anywhere at any given time over issues. Right? If you think about the millions of issues that are affecting us in the organizations and in uh, whether they're priority issues, national security issues, there's just millions out there. At any given time, this is a useful way to sort of categorize them. We can take those issues and we can put them in the cooperative realm, the competitive realm, and the conflict realm, right? Um, and then we do that so we kind of have an awareness for what's important uh, and, and then have a way to focus and prioritize on what needs to be managed issue-wise. So cooperation seems easy. Hey, it's in the cooperative realm. Just leave it there. Yeah. But... It's not hard for things to go to, from cooperative to competitive. So it takes effort. It's going to take time, any, and effort to prioritize, hey, there's issues in the co cooperative realm. We really, really want to keep those there. So let's put a little extra you know, attention there. Uh, maybe we see something slipping, um, and we want to make sure it's solidified and stays there. That's important, right? Um, and and that's, that's a way that defense organizations think about issues there's too many out there at any given time you got to have a way to manage this right so there are tremendous efforts regionally uh and this is why you have six different geographic combat commands and dod that uh, kind of split up the whole world 
and they help to manage these issues, prioritize them, rack them and stack them and give them category of meaning, right? So there are those things and DOD and defense organizations have a pretty strong role in the cooperative realm and keeping things cooperative, right? This is why we have our service members all over the world sometimes because they help to strengthen cooperation. They help to maintain that. They help to uh, conduct confidence building, which is really important. But at the end of the day, most issues, most states uh, are in a natural competitive uh, sort of disposition, right? That's what we see. And that's not necessarily bad, right? So I broke this out. This is a graphic I made recently, minus this base one from DOD for an article we just published in terms of what do we need to start thinking about the Arctic? Things have changed. Obviously, with what's going on in Ukraine, we're witnessing uh, significant changes. So one thing we need to know right up front is a lot of stuff we have enjoyed in the cooperative realm is not there anymore. It's it's going to shift into the competitive realm, right? And we need to understand a couple of things. There's two major categories of competition at any given time, right? There's healthy and unhealthy, right? And that's the natural state of most issues in regions. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but this is where we pay a lot of attention. And this is where we start to get really nervous when things start to get into that unconstructive area of competition, right? When issues start to elevate, then they escalate. Then they get into that zone of miscalculation, that's where we're going to have some problems because at any given time, uh, our most difficult adversaries are going to put a lot of effort in trying to make us make a mistake, right? That is a, that is a huge uh, strategic goal of most of our adversaries is setting us up to make mistakes because that just opens the door for some behavior we don't want, right? So we really got to pay attention here and we got to keep that those issues that are creeping into the unconstructive, unhealthy part of competition, you know, get it back into constructive, right? It's the sort of the natural state of what we are always, uh, always in a, uh, kind of experiencing. So, and, and this is what DOD uh, uses largely to help manage awareness of issues. Right, because national security issues and priorities interests are largely managed by the foreign affairs authorities, right? GAC and the State Department and so on and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but DOD has a significant role, right? Because they're the force and the power that can back up a lot of the the words, uh, and that's that that sort of represents what is the basics of national security, foreign affairs and defense authorities kind of carry the daily massive burden of national security at any given time with lots of support from the other agencies. But the two primaries, definitely uh, foreign affairs in the lead, supported generally by defense authorities, right? So that means the defense authorities uh, really need to understand what's going on with these issues, these regions. They got to be prepared. They got to do the studies. They got to educate. They got to be educated. So um, they're part of the solution and partnered with the foreign affairs authorities. Because you never know when there's going to be a task that the defense authorities need to conduct to really emphasize something um, that's a national uh, security um, uh, requirement. Uh, so Defense authorities can't wait for something to blow up in some region to start learning about it. We got to learn everything we can now so we can be part of the discussion and part of the solution uh, as, as stuff happens, right? So this is a tool. This is sort of a way in a broad sense, uh, you know, 30,000 foot view where we look at issues, right? There's too many out there. Now, hopefully that makes sense. It's a, it's a quick intro into um, sort of this very dynamic world. <clears throat> so 
there has been a shift, a significant shift in the Arctic region, right? The circumpolar north, which has enjoyed significant cooperation for 20 some odd years of active engagement in climate change related issues, security related issues, right? Civilian or uh, defense, hard security. There has been a lot of cooperation, right? Um, as of February of this year, though, because of Russia's behaviors, uh, we can no longer uh, do business with them like we have. A lot of stuff changed in 2014 um, from the annexation of Crimea alone. We saw uh, quite the reaction from the international community, and we had a lot of concerns right away for what does this mean for the Arctic? What's this going to do to the Arctic Council? And fortunately, within a short amount of time, um, the business of the Arctic Council was able to continue unimpacted and uh, was remained relatively healthy up until uh, February of this year, right? And and with the reinvasion of 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 uh, Ukraine in February, it just became impossible to continue to do business with Russia uh, in the Arctic especially with them as the chair of the Arctic Council. It was just untenable. Um, and this was not easy, uh, not an easy decision uh, to make because we, we understood the impacts. Right? Russia is the largest actor in the Arctic of the Arctic Gate. And we knew there would be a very strong reaction to this. There would be uh, strong uh, competitive geopolitical issues uh, escalating because of this. Uh, and we understood well the ramifications, but it wasn't necessary, right? For Russia, it's, for them, it's normal business. And you'll see they're continuing to message how, and they do this very consistently, right? This is sort of a, a way that Russia thinks and behaves, and it is consistent. Um, but they don't quite understand consequences necessarily, but they do. They they act in a way that for them, it's natural to have a, con, you know, conduct and behave in a certain way in a certain part of the world and have it completely separate from other parts. So what they're doing in Ukraine to them should have no impact whatsoever on Arctic affairs. And that's how Russia naturally thinks, right? That's, that's, it's been consistent. That's that's how they think and behave. Um, however, uh, we have limits too, right? So we're not going to be doing business with Russia in the Arctic as we have in the past in in whatever category or sector we can talk about. It's just not going to happen, right? And we've seen some incredible changes as a result. Uh, sanctions alone have been uh, fairly devastating, but suspending and not recognizing and, and pausing Russia's role in the Arctic Council, obviously been one of the bigger ones for us. And that causes us to have to look at what does that mean? We've had years and years, you know, 26 years in the Arctic Council working very well with Russia, uh, outstanding member and partner of the Arctic Council, uh, bringing as much value as everyone else and very focused um and it, it's it was really rewarding to see that and very helpful because uh, uh, for many reasons one of which is anything that came out of the arctic council anything that got published was as good as it gets right you had projects and initiatives that would make it through the agenda and get adopted uh, sponsored by two nations, uh, two member states, uh, as required by charter, and then backed up by all kinds of support, largely that comes from the observers. Um, that's that's a big part of their role. And then managed by one of the working groups, the ones, one of the six working groups, with that primary input from um, the permanent participants. All of this happening because of the permanent participants, largely, helping to direct those priorities. Right, so you got the full force and power of the Arctic Council, which brings national uh, resources and global expertise to any project or initiative. 
and whatever comes out as a result publication wise is as good as it gets because it represents all eight Arctic nations. It has been completely reviewed and approved by all eight Arctic nations. And it's not gonna get any better than that. Like there's really no other arrangement. So it had great meaning um, from the work alone. And that was extremely important uh, to uh, not only the scientific community, academia, defense, foreign affairs, it, the work wasn't just scientific. The work represented a lot more. The work represented cooperative efforts that weren't experienced anywhere else in the world, right? And, and so on and so forth. Um, so with the changes, the shift from cooperative to competitiveness, that's gonna probably be experienced in the Arctic now, uh, given the changes, we gotta understand some of the basics there, which seems sort of obvious, right? It's like, no, duh, things change and, you know, but in, in the diplomatic world alone, whether it's civil diplomacy or military diplomacy, these nuances are extremely important, right? It, it can sometimes take years and years and years to build up any trust to deal with any issue. And the changes that you're going to experience in having to deal with an issue, whether it's cooperative or competitive, are, are important. And let's look at, you know, we got a few here. The ability just to communicate is, is going to be hindered. Uh, trust erodes. Obstructiveness becomes part of that, that competitive game, right? And all these things go from you know, nice and healthy, working together, get stuff done, um, and, and focus on the issue itself to a whole different world. And it has, you know, it has important effects. So it has important effects on defense world. It has huge effects on the diplomatic world uh, and also academia, you know, and research, all of these things are impacted. Right, when it comes to the Arctic, uh, obviously it's magnified. Uh, because all of us are working on issues and problems that are uh, high latitude based. And some of the most important science involving climate change research right now is focused on that because we're able to inform the rest of the world more effectively because of our location as a result. Uh, and we really need everything to be working very well because science is extremely difficult under the best of circumstances in terms of being able to in, inform policy. And we know we live this every day, um, the geopolitics of stuff. And, and even when science is going absolutely perfectly, we, we understand there's still challenges um, and problems getting some of that translated into into effective policy so we certainly don't need things changing now as we are experiencing probably uh impacts from climate change uh with more frequency intensity and duration than we have in the past um we really need things to stay in the in the most optimal situation which was cooperative right and i learned this from reading about uh martin deutsch who after World War II developed and focused, uh, he's, a, he's a psychologist and he worked and focused on this thing called peace theory, peace psychology um, for the purpose of understanding how to apply that to security issues for the defense world, right? And no one really has done anything compared to him. I, we, we understand the world is always in this cooperative, competitive, or con conflict mode, but I was looking for any, any literature that sort of informed that, and I was extremely fortunate to fall upon Deutsch's work, who developed this from a completely different field for this purpose. And I dug into this, and it's just phenomenal. Uh, I highly recommend getting into this because so much of this is applicable in the way he explains it. Uh, is is very important. Um, it really will sort of unpack a, a way to understand 
how do diplomatic authorities think? How do these you know, decision makers and actors think? Um, and what are these, what are the big uh, important differences between uh, cooperation, competition, and conflict? Right. So that's been a huge focus and a big help to me uh, in recent years. All righty. One other thing. So in the world of academia and research, and I, I got hit up by the media and others on this soon after uh, February this year and the Arctic Council pausing its activities and then uh, not doing business with Russia right now. A lot of questions on what does that mean? I mean, understanding there's a huge difference between sort of what the Arctic Council does project-wise versus all the other scientific institutes. They're close, they overlap. They're not exactly the same, but it's still research, it's still effective, it's still needed, right? And the Arctic Council has the ability to you know, establish projects and initiatives, and then it puts together the best teams in the world. Uh, I've been fortunate to be on a couple. Uh, it's it's a whole different way of doing work, which is uh, quite amazing. Um, but we all know that scientific cooperation is one of those areas that was crucial that we enjoyed for a long time in the Arctic. You know, it came with its challenges. Getting permits from Russia to study sea ice and its waters, never easy. <laughs> I got a bunch of researchers up here that I love to tell the annual story of how painful it was for them to gain access to anything. And, you know, they're former Russians too. So uh, never easy, but doable. But now it's just going to be a lot harder, uh, if even possible. Right. And in world academia, uh, in science and research, uh, for those out there that are involved in this, and, you know, for diplomats and defense authorities too, hopefully this helps them to understand in our world there have been enormous impacts. This is what happens when you shift to competition, right? We're already under the best of circumstances. We deal with this constant thing that sheds uh, doubt on our work always. And it's known as uncertainty, right? And we're highly accountable. As researchers, we are extremely accountable about our uncertainty. And we always present that in whatever effective metrics with emphasis. Because we never say 100%. There's no such thing as that in research, right? There's never 100%, especially when it comes to climate change, right? So everything we do, all our results always come uh, with um, limitations and uncertainty. And for us, it's very natural. Um, but in the political and geopolitical world, that can be sort of interpreted differently, right? Um, so cooperation was an area where we could reduce uncertainty. And in terms of that, one of the more important things in, in uh, culminating events of a lot of research is being able to develop scientific models, right? When the whole world comes together, uh, a scientific community is able to say, we've tested all of the algorithms, all of the uh, formulas, all of the data around the world to these, and we have one model. This model is the one we all agree on, right? That's very powerful. That's a way to uh, help convince and inform policy, uh, probably as good as it gets, right? With the least amount of uncertainty. So when you get global consensus behind something, what that looks like often in the scientific world is, you know, a, a, an established scientific model. Right. The scientific cooperation is is required for that. Right. We have got to work together because you can't establish more authoritative models by just studying stuff in your own backyard and going, hey, look, here's how this works. It doesn't work that way. Right. Perfect example in one of our recent publications was well, how this works in the world of permafrost. Right. We got boreholes all over the world that we know about that are reported right and we got all collected in a global database like the central database that exists right now uh, one of my co-authors who's the director of this manages 
um, public sector, private sector, you name it. Boreholes are basically just tons of data points and will tell us all kinds of stuff that would be valuable data in terms of taking maybe the formulas or calculation algorithms you can develop in Alaska. If you could take that and then take a bunch of Russian or Siberian permafrost data, dump it in there. And if you're getting similar results or different, you know how to adjust and vice versa. So we got to always test our models um, uh, until we got that universality, right? However, we do know we got boreholes all over the planet. All of them, they're, you know, not, I mean, not everyone, all, all the ones that are known are all on the database. And you can go to that database right now and look, and they're there, they're listed. And in the data column, empty, absolutely empty, right? And the reason this happens isn't, necessarily deliberate it's a default state uh, the reason we don't share data is because you never know what can be done with data to sort of reveal something about a competitor that is undesirable right so the natural state of most nations especially those that sponsor research is to say hey you can't share your data right it's not deliberate out of sheer paranoia. It's just with enough data, you can you can ascertain an important stuff about an adversary. So the natural state is uh, by national, you know, policies. You cannot share that data, like NSF or NIH or whatever, uh, unless it's specifically allowed. And uh, this one example we're trying to uh, sort of highlight: hey, you really need to share that data. We're fairly certain that we're beyond the point of revealing sensitive sort of interpretations about that data versus how critical it is to know permafrost right now, permafrost thaw. We have got to know this. That's way more important than these other relevant sensitivities at this point. Um, and that's part of you know, the world of scientific cooperation is like, you got to share the data in the end, because we won't get to that ultimate point. Uh, being able to develop those those critical models, right? So we got some issues right now without having that cooperation, but all is not lost. The very likely, hopefully, the uh, research is continuing and hopefully in the future, we'll have a way to come back together and, and just, you know, stitch it together quickly. Uh, and hopefully the, the lack of, or the impacts of scientific cooperation in the Arctic aren't resulting in gaps in data. As you all know, uh, gaps in data are really can magnify uncertainty. Um, so it was addressed uh, and, and, and maybe minimizing gaps, because that's, that's where things get a bit scary. Okay, I think we are ready to talk a little bit about defense authorities. When it comes to climate change impacts, they're not a threat to defense authorities. Right now, I imagine you're watching this and this is your face. So what do I mean by that, right? That is a bold statement. Uh, I'm not just making that up. That's not just some strange thing. It's uh, definitions and processes work. They're different, right? And we throw around the word threat a lot. Um, however, that has a very distinctive meaning to defense authorities. We have very, very specific definitions for a threat. And that's, that's what this means. So there are differences in, in how this works. In, in the Department of Defense, we have some definitions that may help clear this up for you, right? Uh, whatever we're doing, we have a sort of priority, a list of priorities that we're working on that are part of our strategic thinking and plans, right? Our requirements and what we're doing. One of those are based on lines of effort, right? And the other is lines of operation. And these are completely different, right? Um, lines of operation are the ones to focus on here. And this is what tells you why climate change impacts cannot be defined as a threat, right? 
the threat has to be an actor that you can influence that you can close with and uh, destroy right so those action verbs we use in the military you can't do that in the environment right it has to be an adversary lines of effort though can be all the other things and those those, those things associated with the uh, what impacts lines of operation it's probably called different things in different uh, nations defense authorities but it's the same thing you, right uh what you need to know though is it, it is important climate change is uh, impacts are extremely important to department of defense but it, it falls under our already established well-defined um processes and thinking in terms of strategy and planning development where we look at the climate change as another just a normal part of the process labeled as an environmental planning factor right that's what we look at climate change is and any any part of the planet if we're going to do an operation or prepare to do an operation we study the environment for the planning factors all right what's going on in the environment what do we need to do and know in order to operate right it's not a threat it's just here's the environment what do i need to do to be able to operate successfully there uh, and survive and succeed right so we call that an environmental planning factor it's it's uh it's quite dynamic obviously in, in the arctic and there's significant uh aspects to take into consideration but this is how we've always dealt with this and in some way shape or form other defense organizations uh, likely do the same thing right so hopefully that makes a, a bit more sense to you and what i would tell everyone is this should hopefully spark some ideas about what your role could be in this right uh, especially the future leadership right uh, all of you studying the arctic and climate change impacts uh, you have more power than you think you're the future you're the future leadership we're stumbling on this things are happening all kinds of different categories and sectors of competition and we're just trying to keep things together and hopefully prepare you and pull you into this so you can take over and lead right so if defense authorities think about the arctic climate change impacts in terms of an environmental planning factor somebody needs to help them understand what that is right and that's you all that's where you come in that's where my university comes in that's where i focus with the strategies and plans sections the j5s uh in the similar um sections in 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 the different defense authorities right somebody has to be able to do the research and inform the defense authorities on this is what this part of that environment means to you use it however you need here's the information and defense authorities know they're the first to go okay do we have somebody that knows how to study this okay they may already have an ffrdc or a research component that's designated okay if not okay what university can we call and i get calls all the time like hey um, from this section i just got tasked to study uh, this thing involving uh, arctic uh, environment and we need to know this thing about conducting expeditionary operations and how do we deal with like wastewater management uh, can you do that for us and I'm like yes we can absolutely so that's that's only going to accelerate right and defense authorities are going to need all the help they can get internally and externally on how to inform those environmental planning factors because as we all know we don't hardly know anything about the arctic let alone how to operate so it's a wide open world uh, for you all and i hope this maybe sparks a little bit of uh ideas um, on what you could do in the future all right so a lot of that may be uh you know lines of operation directly involved could be line of effort involved right so the defense authorities are absolutely thinking about climate change impacts they just do it differently okay that's blew by quickly uh hopefully some of this was useful and maybe begins a discussion right covering three huge areas and uh 
and I, you know, thank you for your time and, and uh, let's, let's, uh, let's talk. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll leave the floor open if anyone has any questions. And if not, I'll just uh, ask you questions that I've prepared. All right. I'll ask you um, a first question, just in terms of the three approaches, um, well, the three policies that you mentioned that were released in October, how, has that affected, um, no, how has that affected in terms of um, the deterrence approach that the, usually what the Americans operate by in the Arctic? Has it changed? It's going to change. Uh, so with those three strategies, hopefully uh, you're, you're all familiar with that. The first one being the national strategy in the Arctic region that came out from the White House with all kinds of guidance, which will be followed up by an implementation strategy next year, right? So that, that breaks it down a little bit more with uh, who will be the the lead leads for the pillars and, and whatnot. Uh, followed up five days later by the new national security strategy, which had Arctic language in it for the first time ever which is a big deal because now things are going to be placed into the requirements category and Congress has to fund that. So this is a whole different world. Previously, Arctic efforts did not have to be uh, funded by Congress, except for those maybe with Title 14 U.S. Coast Guard uh, polar responsibilities. Uh, but for the rest, no. But now, now we got some room here. We got some actual mandatory requirements. And then the national defense strategy came out at the end of October. And it had uh, sort of continued Arctic language in it. Uh, but within a few months of next year, we're going to see a new DOD Arctic strategy. Right? And we're already working on that. And it's going to reflect all these changes. And deterrence will be huge. So the key word there, deterrence, which is, is not very well understood. Some of that stuff can be vague and ambiguous, but it's especially important in the Arctic. I think we all know that it's just more difficult to work in the Arctic, right? The, we don't have the infrastructure, especially in the North American Arctic, to be able to operate the, the same way as you might in the North, in, in the European Arctic, where there's a lot more infrastructure. Right? So we just don't have the resources and assets up there to operate in the north. So if something happens in the north, in Canada uh, or the United States and here in Alaska, we tend to surge resources to take care of that issue. Right? We both do that. RCMP, right? they got to go to whatever village. Our state troopers got to go to whatever village. Civil security, defense, all of it would be a surge, expeditionary move forward and, and try to operate in the area the best you can. And, and uh, for anyone that's ever done that, or even if you can imagine what that's like, and we'll tell you what it's like, it becomes really important to prevent everything possible from happening in the North. It's, you know, and what that turns into, what that means is the acceptance for risk really needs to be lowered in the Arctic because responding in, to incidents in the Arctic is, is so difficult, so expensive, and, and so filled with uh, danger and, uh, and other problems that, you know what, it's, it's absolutely imperative to just prevent everything possible we can, right? You, and we, we can't play games with risk. We can't, like we do elsewhere where it's like, okay, if something happens, whatever, we got plenty of resources to, to flood and respond. You can't do that in the North, right? And at the end of the day, we don't have all the answers and we're crushed with uncertainty. But I can tell you one thing, just put all kinds of money, time and effort on prevention. And that'll solve a lot of problems for you, right? And, and what that looks like is at the end of the day in the defense world, uh, it looks like deterrence. Let's just keep this stuff from happening because none of us wants to have to figure out the hard way how to operate up there, how to respond. And in some cases we know we just can't. So just to build up on that, um, I'm asking that it's a bit speculative, but I'll ask that. 
um, there's been recent movement in, in Irkutsk on the uh, Russian Far East of companies purchasing land, namely the Chinese. Yep. So how plausible would it be for the Chinese not to invade, but to slowly make their way into the Arctic? And what's the implication for, um, well, for the Americans? It, uh, does it include, um, you know, responding with companies or is it just strictly government? No, good question. Uh, I've been looking at this one for a while, and I've been talking to one of you know Canada's lead Arctic authorities, Adam Lajanus, on this. And um, it's not the first time, but in a couple of years now, we have seen interest and potential for China to creep into the Russian Far East, um, Arctic Far East. And this may not be alarming to some folks, but it should be. Um, mostly Russia. You know, for Russia, Arctic identity is is really, really important. Uh, it, it's why it became one of the first things that Russia focused on uh, in post-Cold War, when it looked to rebuild itself and become, you know, a nation state of power again. It looked to the Arctic to achieve this in some ways, because the Arctic represents challenge and difficulty and if you can conquer it that means you must be a powerful nation a capable nation and uh, that's a huge point of pride for russians and you know of the many concerns of china starting to encroach and have these sort of colonial opportunities in the russian far east arctic which should be of huge concern is the erosion of russia's arctic identity among other things. And the reason this is happening, I think, as you, you know, is in the in the Far East, which is vastly different from the European side of Russia, there's uh, completely different uh, conditions, not a lot of attention paid. It's, some of these places are very difficult to live in. Um, they don't get a lot of resources and attention from Moscow, right? And China has been very interested in working and operating in these areas and has appealed to Moscow and all of its sort of uh, partnership efforts between Beijing and Moscow to take advantage of Russia in this way, which has resulted in the Kremlin and Putin um, developing and facilitating uh, business conditions very favorable to China you know, and forcing these Far East Russian companies, private sector especially, and citizens uh, to accept these favorable business arrangements with China over their own. And that is a very concerning uh, development when you think in terms of like China thinks in such long terms that we all know too, you don't give China one foot in the door, right? You gotta be really careful about this. And if you start developing these, these, these conditions where it's allowed to uh, entrench itself, we know how that results sometimes. So Moscow's behavior and the way they've facilitated Chinese to slowly creep in encroach into the Russian Far East, that should be a huge concern uh, to Russia. How that gets resolved someday or what that results in, who knows? It probably won't be pleasant one way or another. And for us here in the North American Arctic and, and elsewhere, we, we got to look at now another area or sub-region that could be potentially unstable, right? So, uh, for, for now, we're in a very preliminary area, you know, uh, and, and, you know, another thing for us in the West, we're looking in an area that we could sort of exploit, like, hey, you know, uh, Russia, are you just going to abandon the Far East there and all your people? And, right, so as we're competing, uh, we, we got these opportunities to sort of exploit this stuff because we're all concerned about China-Russia partnership, which is also changing. 
and and uh, like Russia and our adversaries in China, we're going to look at ways to sort of wedge that partnership, their effectiveness at working together uh, and compete against the West and neoliberal democracies. And that's going to be one of the ways we may we may take advantage of and, and we'll see what happens. Do you think it's going to impact in terms of um, policies over sovereignty, especially on the American side? Because you have the Arctic Circle and the five nations or states that do hold their titles with other external nations um, slowly creeping up upon. You have like some Arab nations that do hold companies up there. You have the Chinese and others. How plausible is it for it to just completely destabilize? I don't think Russia would let it ultimately, um, but you know, and, and depending on the amount of resources to be ex produced up there is, is going to be uh, critical too. But for for Russia, you're 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 talking about direct impacts on some things that are national priority, like the Northern Sea Route, right? You know, and, and in some some crazy scenario where maybe China's dreaming of the day it can take over a little slice of land up there in the Far East and then start calling itself an actual Arctic nation would be really hugely beneficial uh, and, and uh, kind of ironic in a way. Uh, <laughs> as far as destabilizing, um, you know, I don't think Russia would actually let this happen at the end of the day. But it's it's hard to imagine. Um, part of this is you got to look at the economic value for for China. This is a very difficult thing to measure, and I can talk more about the Russian side more than the Chinese side. Um, but I'm I'm trying to stay up on things as much as possible. But looking at the the China side, in understanding at the at the end of the day, we got to keep asking ourselves the first question, which is how important is the Arctic to China, and whatever whatever interest it has in the Arctic uh, at that moment. And that's not easy to do, right? Um, it could be something that is very, very long-term that China's thinking about, and, and that would have to fit these things that we do know about China, which is what does the Arctic mean to China now? Well, not, not a whole lot. And in the grand scheme of things, when you look at the whole world in how China is is managing and competing in the whole world, the Arctic is 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 a part of uh, its po its polar thinking. So the Arctic isn't necessarily separate, right? It's the polar part that is a component of global importance to China, and it's not even the bigger part of the polar program. Right. Antarctica is far more important than the Arctic to China right now, uh, especially since the Arctic is not uh, working out so well for China in terms of access and influence. Uh, but it is part of its polar thinking and the polar th component to uh, of importance to its global endeavors is significant. Um, and not unlike Russia, uh, some of the things that are, are acceptable and valuable to the Chinese people that they do appreciate about the regime is getting into the Arctic, into those severe uh, environmental conditions and, and operating in ways that are technologically uh, and operationally uh, superior to other nations. And Chinese people like that. When they when they read about the Arctic, what they appreciate, they don't they don't they're not impressed by reporting about the impacts of climate change to like food security for them. That's not what's in the media and exciting and interesting for Chinese people to read. What is is when China's in the Arctic doing scientific uh, endeavors and and conducting engineering and technological feats. They like that, right? That's acceptable to them. Uh, and that is uh, an ac acceptable part of the regime's uh, performance. And, and 
and thus, you know, that's sort of how the, the regime versus uh, the PRC sort of behaves. And this is what I'm being taught and learning and seeing um, as far as where, you know, how important is the Arctic to China? And that's, that's where we see things really uh, uh, that can help us to explain Chinese interests and behaviors. That's what we need to know. And then all the things that go with that. And when we know that well, we'll be able to plug in like, okay, what does this Far East thing mean then? What is the potential there? The same way we've looked at, okay, what did all that Greenland investment potential look like? And why were they doing that? And when we quickly unpack that, when China did make a move, we kind of knew what to do, all right? We had some good partners and we landed in a good place. Um, and China has largely failed to economically entrench itself in the Arctic, but they're not done, right? They're not done, not even close to done, right? They try to, uh, in, in pursuit of their goals, we know that China's number one goal and plan A was to gain access and influence to governance in the Arctic, right? That's been their number one goal, right? And plan A was get in there with sort of brute force policy and rhetoric. Started off with, hey, we're a near Arctic nation. We're like, whatever. Nope. And they kept pushing it and they tried and they they tested that out. And then it landed in the white paper and policy. And we're like, ain't happening. Nope. <laughs> so they stopped. They stopped saying that. You're not going to see China's officials really say that anymore they're done with that phrase they realize it's it's ridiculous it ain't working and for the west to kind of keep saying that and throwing that in their face it's not a good idea anymore china's moved past that so we look a little bit silly and we we need to we need to keep up with china so they're thinking something else plan b entrench themselves economically start buying up everything get access and influence by getting prime land in iceland working out things with Finland, maybe getting us some access to that Arctic corridor idea they're thinking about linking to Europe, get into Greenland. Let's invest in those international airports they want to do. Let's start boosting mining. Let's kind of do all these things that we can do. And across the board, everyone's like, nope, nope, nope. Canada, diamond mines, nope, get out. Nope, 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 nope. So poor China has done very little in terms of reaching what we know as foreign direct investment levels, that ultimate level of really entrenched economic activity. So they've been re reduced to the non-investment level economic activities, the smaller ones. And, uh, and those smaller ones are what they try to work on in terms of developing those into the foreign direct investment, that top level, we are economically entrenched, we basically own you. That's what they wanted in the Arctic, and none of that developed that way, All right? So <clears throat> that was plan B, and it's kind of failed all over the place, and they know it, right? And, and stuff I've talked about with the State Department and DOD is like, what we need to think about now is what's plan C through Z, because they're not done, right? So in all of this needs to fit in with like, what is the importance of the Arctic to China? And in any given day, that's not easy to answer. And then you see these little movements. Okay, Far East, what's going on there? Uh, it's not easy, uh, especially with China. They think so differently, right? They're, they're planning for 50 to 100 years ahead with a little shift now because Russia's performed so poorly in Ukraine, and the world is basically crushing them, that they probably had to go back and start thinking about, Thanks. okay, we didn't see that one. What can we do to take advantage of this situation, Russia and, and what else? We see what's happening. They're like, oh yeah, Russia, since no one wants your natural gas, we'll buy it, but it's going to be at our cost, right? And probably in one, so get ready to eat Chinese currency at, at a lower rate than you wanted. And in part two, what China's really focused on is since Russia has been basically exiled from Europe, China's like, we want in, right? This is our moment to get in. And uh, that was probably not in their strategic thinking recently. And the opportunity is probably clearly opened up much faster than they ever hoped for.
So uh, it'll be interesting to see how China shifts to this relatively blazingly fast opportunity that doesn't normally conform to their way of thinking. Uh, uh, but something's going on for sure. Uh, can't wait to see it. Taking a look at their treaty on friendship, and most of the agreements have been on, you know, building economic prosperity between them, you know, the whole policy and slowly moving into Siberia, just very slowly moving into them. And then I don't know what they hope for, but, you know, getting into the Arctic. <clears throat> but from the Western perspective, what's been the move in terms of do they, do they see that? Do they notice that? Um, is there any strategies in place for for it, you know? I don't, I don't know what Russia is thinking. Um, this is different. These are different times in, in terms of what may Russia, what may be Russia's opportunity right now with this. They know this is going on. Most Russian people, uh, in officials and in citizens alike, don't trust China at all. Right. So they've just been conveniently partnered on these things. And it's clear to Russia, who's the number one target of IP theft of China, that they're not to be trusted. This partnership, everyone's like, what is the end game to this stuff? Because this will not end well. What's going on here? Um, they're tracking, they know. And, and I'm a bit concerned in terms of Russia is sort of in such a bad place right now. And they've lost most of their geopolitical meaningful friends that they're left with China, who's in a position to really take advantage of them, but bail them out of a lot of you know big problem areas that Russia, to me, I'm concerned that Russia knows this, but they also know they have no choice. And I'm wondering if, if their plan is to basically just milk this for all it's worth out of China and then someday just shut them out of the room or force them out or do something that would be extremely concerning to the West. Make a power move to end that relationship once it's, you know, uh, once it's sort of run its course or become unmanageable for the Kremlin, right? And I'm wondering to what extent, okay, with that, you know, so now I'm doing the back and forth game. Okay, if China knows that, then how are they going to manage that and be so careful so they can milk this for all it's worth? You know, and that cycle has been spinning in my head for uh, many months now. And uh, we, we, you know, what we do know and watching Putin's behavior has been very telling because he knows this is happening. So he's not trying to put himself in a really bad position that forces uh, Xi Jinping to make a statement that makes it very clear. There's here's a limit to our friendship. And it's been very close, right? They got this nice statement on friendship, but it's boy, that's eroded big time. They need to redo that that document. <laughs> They're frenemies at best right now. Um, the <sighs> This is this is the main reason Xi Jinping will voice no support for Russia in his Ukraine behavior right now, right? Because China doesn't really care about Russia or Ukraine. China cares about access to Europe right now in other markets. And it doesn't want anything to do with being sanctioned because it, it took a position with Russia on its behavior in Ukraine, not happening, hasn't happened. Most of us knew it wasn't gonna cause it would have been just a bad idea. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, we, we know that China and Xi Jinping have been very effective in, in knowing that um, the world order has it, as it has been, has not been to their benefit especially in the directions they wanted to go in recent decades. So what they've done is rewrite the world order. They created their own new world bank and other massive international institutions because they don't want to deal with the West anymore. And it's working, right? 
and that's all you know kind of tenuous and whatnot but what china's not going to do is endanger all of that to appease russia and show a little bit of support for ukraine ain't happening you know so as fast as concerning as this partnership was developing this started to erode uh, pretty quickly in the SEO meeting in uh, Central Asia um, this summer, uh, was it August or September, really showed the limits uh, of Putin's friends out there, especially Xi Jinping. He took one picture with him and he wouldn't be in any, he wouldn't be in the room with him after that. So there's obviously some movement going on um, and none of it's good for, for Russia. And it should be a very huge concern to us for China because they're really playing things carefully, strategically, very smart. And the focus is Europe. And uh, I think at this pace, it's gonna uh, it's gonna expose these problems between Russia and China. You know, uh, th this is just this is really bad for for Russia and. I don't see a lot of room for them to save face, to take advantage of and show strength and partnership with China anymore. Like they're just, this is not working out. These positions are falling apart because they sort of require these commitments that China's like not touching it. There's just more and more of that I see. And I can't see this ending well. Um, and sooner than later then, I think. I've noticed um, in the Far East again, uh, Russia vowed years ago during the Soviet Union for environmental stewardship, right? Yeah. But with the increase of like these Chinese companies polluting, namely in the Irkutsk region, where they just discharge a lot of chemicals in the water, um, there has. Don't you think that there would be? Uh, conflict spearing between the Chinese and Russia over their environments because at this point the more that although the friendship idea is well to them it's viable but the more that it it, it, it there's like a lot of implications in terms of the environment for Russians they wouldn't just possibly keep it going right they wouldn't allow that would mm. you think no you're right you're spot on there that's an area we can exploit big time right so this is something I did research on a while ago. Russia's, the importance of the Arctic environment for Russia is, is uh, very well known and very well documented uh, and, and should be well known. But this does come in two flavors. One's the terrestrial environment uh, versus the maritime environment. So post-Cold War, we, the West was tracking a lot of problems, especially in the Murmansk um, region in terms of uh, pollution that was Arctic related. It's the nuclear center of everything Russia. And post-Cold War Russia, um, some of the groups got in immediately to the areas we knew were huge problems. The waste, the nuclear storage facility, waste storage was was the first thing that got targeted and, and quickly, especially with Norway's help, who contributed more money than anyone else, started to uh, deal with environmental issues in the Arctic. And Russia, you know, and, and Putin at that point, they fessed up immediately. They knew. And he had already started sort of his strategic goal by admitting, yep, we did some bad things in the Arctic. We want to clean it up. So the G20 pumped a ton of money. And Putin at that point developed policies and requirements for maintaining a, you know, developing and cleaning up the Arctic maritime environment. We're talking the coast and everything in the north, water-related, um, very deliberately. And he showed the world, constantly showing the world all of the efforts Russia is doing to remediate the environment and then keep it absolutely clean. Here's policies, here's organizations that are going to oversee this stuff. Here's programs, here's money, here's a lot of pictures. Look at all this stuff. And without a doubt, they're doing it. They got the Northern fleet out there scrubbing rocks. Like it was happening. And they wanted the world to know this stuff. And they've been extremely consistent. On land, not so much. 
right? But on land doesn't matter to them because the control that they want over the northern sea route in the northern waters requires that they sort of demonstrate that they're environmentally responsible. Otherwise, their, inner, their, their legal case is going to be you know, pretty uh, suspect. So he knew this and he understood, okay, if I'm going to be, if I'm, you know, ultimately I'm going to control access to the northern waters of Russia, I have to develop the best circumstances possible. So uh, I know my argument is going to be that we got to protect the environment. So his number one priority has been cleaning that up like no one's business. It's been, it's been demonstrated and shown to the world because that's a huge part of his legal case and justification for his behavior which is continuing now doesn't matter what's happening on land except <laughs> for when stuff that happens in the land ends up in the maritime so when norilsk had its massive spill um that really really upset putin because that went straight into the arctic and he, he was livid, but he couldn't do a whole lot because uh, the the oligarch at the time is one of the oldest and most powerful, Patanin, who, you know, Putin had no one to reach out to to sort of keep accountable uh, and show the world like, okay, this, this guy violated my policies. I'm going to put him in jail or kill him. Or he couldn't even do that to him. And Putin was so pissed off. <laughs> Um, visibly shaking, he couldn't do anything about this. And he, he knew that this could be really bad for him in terms of he's done so much to demonstrate to the world, consistently taking care of the Arctic maritime environment of Russia, that uh, this guy comes in, does this thing, could be used against him. He was so upset. Uh, he thrashed around the Kremlin and, you know, and whatnot after, but um, it was clear indication uh among other things and then we got a chapter coming out on this stuff that this is no joke this is a huge priority for russia right so that chinese environmental record and pattern and behavior that is not going to happen it's not going to fly uh in terms of anything that has to do with russia's maritime environment right um can't tell you uh, on the terrestrial parts of the Arctic and Siberia and whatnot, the Far East, I don't know. I'm not sure what Russia would be willing to accept in terms of Chinese environmental behaviors, but they will accept no risk whatsoever in anything that has to do with maritime environment. None. I'm asking because there was um, a report by Mongolia actually stating that Russia has been slacking in terms of the transboundary rivers found from Irkutsk all the way to Mongolia. There's, I think there's a couple of them. I don't remember their names, but that's been a growing issue. And then it's, it's been released under United Nation like reports that this call yeah. for Mongolia because of Russia, uh, not Russia's behavior, but China's company's behaviors in terms of, well, on Russian soil, that is. Yeah, I can see that. You know, this stuff we got to pay attention to, but, you know, Russia looks at the, terrestrial part of its arctic and everything you know the maritime environment is different but for russia the rest of that is just internal business the world needs to mind its own business right we can you can't hide this stuff anymore which is very you know useful we can see this stuff with synthetic aperture radar we can see this with optical you know radars and remote sensing so you can't hide this stuff anymore and it'll be our job to just kind of keep the pressure on in terms of exposing it and, you know, carrying that narrative. That's something we got to do across, you know, the entire Arctic region. Um, but where Russia's priority is absolutely for sure is, is the maritime environment. Everything else is internal business, mind your own business kind of thing. But we'll see how long that can last. I'll just change a bit on the, in terms of the, the discussion. So what do you think are the common policy mistakes that stakes make in terms of the Arctic? 
Well, depends on what part of the Arctic. Um, policy mistakes. You know, I'd have to, I'd have to say, you know, maybe here in the North American Arctic, we got to pay a little bit more attention to and prioritize uh, human security. I don't think people understand that these climate change impacts are impacting things that aren't uh, traditional national security issues. We got to really look at uh, human security, food security, um, uh, with, with more emphasis. When you know, uh, there obviously there's a lack of understanding how important is the the food supply up in the north and what that brings. And if that food supply is not available, and what is uh, provided for as an alternative is extremely unhealthy to indigenous communities. Um, those effects on, on national security uh, can have drastic effects too. Uh, so I would like to see that stuff in policies, not only just mentioned, given a little bit of a uh, little page space perhaps, but you know, maybe dealt with uh, more as a priority. Uh, but I think the U.S. new strategies are creating the conditions to do so, because these all these strategies were are very synchronized and aligned. So, for example, using the United States as an example for policy mistakes or uh, or policy successes, um, we've I think we've shifted our attitudes more effectively and synchronized all the Arctic-related um, recent strategies to reflect the importance of looking at almost all of this stuff under the climate security umbrella. So that's what's leading the discussion and the narratives for us is this is all climate security one way or another, um, and we're going to commit to that, and we're, we're going to work under that uh, premise and that thinking, and that's where, that's where we'll develop our efforts and priorities. And I think we're going in that direction. It was really, I mean, these strategies, I'm really happy with them. These are some of the better ones I've ever seen. Um, and I, I like the approach. And I think that will facilitate the ability to deal with the things that we might think is, uh, you know, policy failures, like putting a lot of thinking in this area, okay, not helping us right now when we don't have food, right? Or where we've had, you know, two years of complete collapse, fisheries collapse in the Yukon River, which affects Alaska and then Canada, because we got an escapement requirements to allow a certain amount of fish to get into Canada by treaty. Um, and resulted in no catch at all in the United States. Right. And that's in the early runs, mid runs and late runs, two years in a row. Uh, and, and there's so, so many more impacts. And then you see the results of uh, food security, water security, what that does, and, and then how that challenges the ability to talk about, okay, we need to put infrastructure up in the north, but you can't feed the people, okay? So these aren't, man, you know, or we can't, we're not addressing the problem that's resulting in food security issues that we didn't really understand very well, probably don't yet. Um, but I think the, the changes in our recent strategies are going to facilitate this uh, with a lot more purpose. And uh, our research focus in, in general is shifted to take on these challenges too. Um, so I'm, I'm really hoping that, you know, from what I've seen, sort of traditional national security issues that are reflected in policy don't represent reality. And that's what I kind of look at is sort of, okay, those are sort of the failures. And if we can get more focused on the realities and articulate those well in, in policy establishment and implementation, uh, it won't be easy, but it's necessary. And I think we're going in that direction. Yeah. Has we only the... talk about the United States kind of in that way. <laughs> But has the United States, in terms of <clears throat> indigenous treaties and agreements, how's that looking? It's improving. 
it's a challenge. There's no Arctic nation that does not have challenged relationships with indigenous peoples. There's not a single nation except Iceland because they don't have indigenous people, <laughs> right? But none of us has uh, uh, a good record of that and it always needs improvement. And um, there are many ways to improve that. You know, first, by listening, uh, in inclusivity is required. Uh, starting these projects and initiatives with indigenous leadership, not just asking questions after, right? Uh, so we've shifted our attitudes big time. Some of this is reflected policy in the research uh, sponsorship in terms of, okay, you need to have significant representation in your research team that is indigenous or represents indigeneity. So um, we're going in a good direction there. And it's not been easy because we often work hard. We have, we've struggled to figure out ways to make this knowledge of, of the North conform to our Western science and processes. And we've just butted heads there and it doesn't work. And within a few years recently, I think we've, we've stopped fighting that. And I think we've accepted the fact that, Hey, we, we got to take indigenous ways of knowing as its own science, make it a partnership effort with Western science, not force them into our, Western science ways and maybe vice versa. So I think what I've noticed and experienced, in my opinion, is is that that I think that fight, that frustration may be coming to an end, hopefully. And we're going to accept each other the way we are uh, and then work together uh, in that in that way uh, to 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 make advances. And it's not going to be easy. Um, Every step's been a struggle, but I, I've seen nothing but improvement and progress in the United States on that and meaningful, right? At the end of the day, I want to see indigenous ways of knowing and representation actually helping make the decisions, not just being in the room, not just having, you know, a moment to say something or whatever. And that's what I'm seeing. The Arctic Council is like the best example of this. Sorry, Leila Marie, if I may. Uh, yeah, Professor Buffard, I mean, absolutely fascinating uh, 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 insights you have. I was wondering if I could ask you some very, very basic questions. I mean, for you know, sure. some of our viewers, I, I, I think uh, what what the viewers don't see is that you're actually operating, and, and you know this from uh, having been in uniform, in a very, very difficult environment. And frankly, it'd be probably easier to recover you if you were an astronaut in space. Um, <laughs> There's no railroad between you and me, and and the, the the main road between Alaska and where I am in Canada is, is a reality show of trucks being recovered off the side of a road, uh, and that's you know that's in the good season. Um, so I was wondering if I could ask you you know just a, a series of, of basic uh, operating questions and then ask some uh, questions about uh, policy. Um, I mean, just first off, uh, again from your experience now and your experience in uniform, just operating equipment. I was an army engineer for 15 years and, uh, you know, in San Diego, you can still see the cold blue current coming from Alaska all the way down the U.S. coast. Where I am on the East Coast, we have a warm current coming up from Mexico. So you're, you're uh, frankly, in the most challenging environment. Uh, just generally speaking for our viewers, what are the technical limits of getting simple things to work? Trucks, yeah. compressors, engines? Yeah, a basic engineering, mechanical uh to the digital world all of it all of it is challenged by the arctic these things don't work in the arctic for a few reasons right they freeze up the batteries these screens aren't made for it and there's hardly any internet or communications up in the north or they're very challenged uh from mechanical parts you know this is where i learned everything from the elders indigenous people we got the most sophisticated stuff on the planet sometimes it gets up in the arctic doesn't work and and you look around the corner and there's an elder running around in his you know 50 year old tractor works fine I mean, it's minus 50 right and it's like how do you do this right and this is where you walk over and you start learning and and they'll tell you all the things you got to change your lubricants you got to change parts and seals uh, they don't work uh, under those temperatures even though maybe they've been tested 
Now, the reality is, is they don't. And, and all of it together, fuel does not work the same in the north. You have to put anti-gel uh, formulas inside of fuel at a certain temperature, right? Propane doesn't work minus 40 and below. Like my tanks here and what I heat, you know, a couple of things with and my stove. Minus 40, I ain't cooking there. I'm cooking on the wood stove. Um, seals uh, don't like that amount of expansion and contraction. Uh, lubricants, all of them have to be changed and they have to be managed in a, in a way, uh, that, that keeps them effective. Uh, you got to understand what deep freeze means when it comes to equipment. And that's everything, everything that operates, uh, jets, you know, tractors, sleds, uh, it, it, it's a thing for uh, a, a machine to go into a deep freeze state, right? Because there's now this thing that has to be done that doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. You have got to warm this up or it is not starting, right? And this is why we don't turn things off in the north. This is why truckers do not turn off the trucks, right? When they're on the ice roads, uh, ever, uh, because you can't restart that stuff without an enormous amount of effort. And we, we experience that all the time up here in the military. We got units from the South who, who, who learn that the hard way. Um, uh, fuel, you got to handle very carefully. You got you to manage that in terms of adding additives to keep it from gelling up, right? So I got a tank underground that's sealed uh, on, under my house and that gets fuel type one here and i got a tank outside my shop here that's above ground that gets fuel type number two because that has additives people in alaska don't even know and probably same thing in in canada fuel stations gas stations they change their fuel automatically usually by september they're already adding the anti-gel stuff if they didn't and i had this happen once i deployed once I, uh, what was I left in the summer? I came back on an R and R, and it was the middle of winter, and I still had summer fuel in my truck, and it stopped. It stopped dead, right? I had it full too because you don't want condensation, and it stopped. And I'm like, what the heck happened, right? And okay, I learned a hard lesson that day. Uh, fuel also it retains the temperature of, of the outside, right? It ain't like water where it just starts freezing at 32 degrees or zero Celsius it will retain minus 60 degrees and it will flash burn you in a second is, you know, so there is endless things that are important to understand about machinery uh, operating conditions and okay, your, your sled broke down, your tractor broke down, whatever. Uh, hey, I'm just going to pop over here to home Depot and get her. No, that doesn't exist in the North. Right. So not only do you have to, take care of your machinery and keep it running and warm one way or another. Uh, now you got to figure out how are you going to fix this if it breaks down because you're not getting parts. You're not running around to the store and getting parts. So you got to bring everything in triple redundancy uh, and think about that stuff ahead of time. That's what makes sustainment in the operational world probably the hardest thing. We look at the war fighting functions, maneuver, fires, command and control intelligence whatnot protection sustainment 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 that one is so brutal uh and we get this in reality we know this uh had a recent briefing at SOC north special operations command north and we had a panel of just logisticians and they just crushed everybody with like horror of the reality and they just came from arctic operations and that's what's needed like that is the hardest part um, your digital world, also hugely effective. All this stuff we're super comfortable with that works great in lower latitudes does not work in the north. Or you got to find uh, something else that works from simple optics on our weapons to communications devices across the board. They suffer greatly. Uh, batteries do not work the same in the north at all. <laughs> you got something that's working off of a battery uh, it, you got to start from scratch. Uh, there's there's have you, endless. Have you seen the the beginning of fiddling or modifications to make electric vehicles viable? Has that begun yet? We've had them up here. We, um, our I think we had a University of Alaska um, professor this summer ran a convoy up to the north. They're viable. Uh, I'm not sure to what extent. Um, 
but I do know they're they're working here. And this year, the state is is um, investing sort of uh, emergency funding into putting up charging stations along the rail boats. We got we got one main road from Anchorage to Fairbanks. So they I think they're going to establish six charging points along that. Uh, it's it's roughly 600 kilometers between Fairbanks and, and Anchorage. Um, I think from what I hear, uh, when it comes to electric vehicles, they work up here fine. Uh, but I think some of the problems involve the fact that the biggest drain on an electric vehicle is is heating, like keeping yourself warm, right? And, and other interesting challenges that way. Uh, but they're up here and, and they work. I got friends that have Priuses for you know, 10 years or whatever, and uh, they seem to work fine. I mean, I have to, again, you know, very, very, very uh, a simple, simple questions from someone who's not in the uh, Arctic. You live under the Aurora Borealis. Are you exposed to more radiation? No, that's non-ionizing. So uh, for us, it's just all kinds of pretty. It's just so gorgeous. I go out, you know, get firewood all the time. And sometimes I forget I'm not wearing anything and I'm just looking at the sky. Uh, no, this is... Uh, this is actually a neat place in terms of that. Uh, it will challenge us a little bit because electromagnetic interference can cause issues with some equipment, right? Uh, so that part, yes, there's more exposure to that, uh, but we're pretty familiar with it. Um, beyond that, like we have this thing called red flag up here as an Air Force multinational exercise. And it's conducted in a few places around the world, but this is the premier spot on the planet. And nations scramble to get to be part of this each year. And it's just, it's wonderful to see all our allies, you know, flying around up here. And they absolutely love it, not just because it's landscape, you know, beautiful landscape and the ability to fly around in, in this terrain is amazing. And you don't have as many concerns about urban areas and policies and noise. And so there's a lot of freedom and ability to move, but also the electromagnetic spectrum up here is pristine. You don't get that anywhere else in the world. There's so much clutter in the spectrum elsewhere that, you know, it's kind of annoying on instrumentation up here pure bliss, just clean as can be. Right. So Wait, and, even in the event of a solar flare, the flares will cause issues, right? So aviators, uh, pilots will tell you in, in the military, if you're flying above a certain uh, latitude, you have to have certain qualifications, including uh, for our own pilots, if I recall correctly from my air guard friends and others, if you're like above 60 degrees or you're flying to the north above 70 or something, you have got to be, uh, it's, a, it's a different grid scale, uh, grid map qualified and you have to be celestial navigation qualified you've got to be able to read the stars in order to be qualified to fly in the north uh because yes uh, it's not just an orientation thing but um bursts can wreak havoc on equipment um and that's you know that's something you know it wasn't too long ago canada learned an expensive lesson we got hit by that massive flare it took out the the east coast upper east coast of right there's a reason that happened and we're, we're we're sort of thinking about that in terms of like what if a really huge one hits us and something that's kind of interesting is is the united states in particular we're not really prepared for this um that's called the the Car a carrington effect i think and it's similar to what happened there in the in the northeast there with canada and new england um it caught yeah. me at the end of an essay fortunately i had just saved it yeah it's it's it'll get you right and the reason that happened is because that built up amount that huge amount of radiation that built up in the inner ties of the electric grid in the in the lines built up so much heat that it couldn't the transformers and uh, couldn't handle it right those insulators couldn't handle it and that's why they kind of just exploded everywhere and the big problem there is is like okay all of those are chinese parts so that's a big problem that would never happen here in alaska interestingly so because all of our lines run north south and the radiation and 
buildup what doesn't happen on north south lines only on east west lines so oh, that's fascinating <laughs> man can i ask you to elaborate on the health issue you did mention uh vitamin d deficiency of course caused yeah. by the you know the, the the lack of sunlight are there other long-term health issues that uh, uh typically affect people living in in the high arctic yeah there uh are disorders up here related to lack of sunlight and um, activity and and natural cycles that happen because of you know natural light that, that is lacking more importantly i think uh, and some of those can be treated i think effectively with nutrients and whatnot and in lifestyles but the mental impacts that is i think the biggest problem we face up here um and not just here it's a it's around the circumpolar north um the Arctic Council did a study on this. Um, I forget the name of it. It's Sunrise. I wish I could remember it. Um, but every Arctic nation, every Arctic nation suffers from significant suicide issues in the north. Every one of us. And so much so that they, they did a uh, quite a comprehensive study on it. And you know, we're facing that problem here in Alaska now with with the military um i'm not sure if the rate is higher than a, a national average but it, it's a problem up here in the north it's a different problem maybe from elsewhere uh, so i think the uh, was a seasonal def uh, seasonal affective disorder or something is is one thing but it's that mental thing and we have significant suicide problems right now um now, one of my friends is the lead uh, researcher for here specifically in Alaska for the military. Um, and uh, it's not just it's not just Alaska, right? Um, and there's a there's a lot of things that are, are associated with that, understanding uh, social pathologies that happen in remote villages and it not not probably not a lot different from Canada. We have similar infrastructure and lack of access. And being isolated in those communities, it means something, right? So um, what researchers have done in the past to 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 be able to understand things, and we're still working really hard at this is, you know, imagine being in a community uh, that's remote, as can be, you know, frozen river or not on a river, not on a road, not on anything, probably don't have even access maybe to a landing strip um and you're experiencing problems right and one of the things the often as a solution to problems is to get away from the problem well you can't do that in some of these villages and you know getting away from that problem also is is a huge issue because you're you're asking someone to leave their home it's so different in the north right and it can just add all these pressures that can add to a, a person trying to thrive and survive in the north under these conditions. Uh, it just starts to really mentally affect people. Um, and if you can't even escape it. Right? I'm just or wondering if, if NASA is not, you know, uh, uh, probably attempted to draw conclusions about whatever, whatever fantasy Elon Musk might have on Mars, if there isn't already you know, we have here, you know, fantastic test cases to see what countermeasures should be taken. And I'm wondering yeah. if the First Nations, as you mentioned earlier, probably have solved some of those problems with the storytelling or the way that they, you know, they adapt to, uh, you know, frankly, an infinite amount of real estate, but uh, sort of human isolation. Um, sure. uh, You're right. You're right. I mean, as an astronaut, you can't escape that. So there is a correlation right there. Like, how do you deal with that? And what does that mean? And that's why it's so important. May, may I ask another, sort of going here from the micro to the sort of the intermediate, um, I, you know, I hear, I, I know very little about this, so I'm, I'm sort of interpolating, but I, I'm imagining that the First Nations are faced, uh, uh, you know, with a political challenge, which is with climate change, you're going to have large numbers of migrants, Russians, Americans, Canadians, moving north into their areas. I have not, not seen it politicized that they object to this immigration. But I'm wondering, I mean, uh, uh, I would, I mean, I would, as an Indigenous person being flooded um, by uh, people from the South, I imagine there, there, you know, there would be some uh, uh, reaction to it. 
Uh, what's your sense of uh, their reaction to this, I guess, uh, Southerner migration? You know, I, I, I haven't seen that develop quite as much as sort of the preliminary thinking. And I had two graduate students study this this semester, which was interesting because they both picked the same topic on their own and they, they come up with it. But the the other concern that's related, which is what happens when these coastal cities start migrating inland? So that's that's a that's what I got a little bit more experience with in terms of just you know shared literature and study. Um, migration from south to north, we haven't, I don't think we've seen much of that as a concern, but what we can draw from immediately is what happens when coastal cities can no longer endure and sustain themselves and they got to move the populations inland. Right, so that is very preliminary right now, but it's of huge concern because you're talking millions and millions of people. What does that look like? Right. And the obviously, I think the extension to that is all right, what if they start coming even further north now? I think that is so, uh, uh, so overwhelming to think about. <laughs> no one wants to touch it, but I got students who are fascinated by that and they want to know, like, why isn't the United States working on policies right now? Right. Uh, to deal and think about this issue, acknowledge it or something, you know, sea level rise, coastal erosion, whatever. Well, um, I, sorry. You know, what have you, I mean, so in Canada, is that been uh, sort of an experience? Uh, to be honest, I, 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 you know, again, it's a tremendous ignorance about what, what the Indigenous experience is in the Arctic. My, my analogy is, you know, 1860s, Russia built the railroad and it, it triggered Japan to go into Hokkaido Island, which they had not done before. And the Chinese had kept Manchuria as a sort of Qing Dynasty Manchurian uh, a Chinese exclusion zone. But when the Russians built their railroad, uh, the Qing Dynasty were afraid that the Russians would move in. So they, they brought in 75 million Chinese, 20 million who stayed, and, and now, you know, th those are the ancestors of the 100 million odd people living in Chinese Manchuria. So the railroad triggered this, this uh, you know, th this migration to hold on to national land. Um, I don't think the Qing in Manchuria were in a position to say no. I think definitely the Ainu in Hokkaido were not happy, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with this, with this state-run attempt to, to, you know, out-migrate the Russians in Japan. I, I, mm -hmm. I imagine the same thing uh, happened um, in, well, I know for a fact it happened in Quebec, but again, the voices were not politically articulated, and so we don't know what the reaction is. Um, it's just that it's an awful lot of real estate. If you're looking at, you know, the Russian Ar Arctic, or you're looking at Canada's archipelago, there are uh, islands bigger than Belgium with no permanent habitation, and, um, you know, the indigenous people there would claim it as as theirs. I mean, they've been there, go going there, you know, doing a very active activities for centuries, and so a bunch of miners showing up from, you know, in, you know, who, wherever in Canada, Edmonton or whatever, they're probably not going to be invited or, or you know, not welcome. Um, uh, it, it's, it's better to give people a voice beforehand rather than have to, you know, solve the problem 100 years later. Um, you know, when, when, you know, we, when they write something down and it wasn't represented. Um, sorry, on, 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 on that, sure. can I ask a, a related question on, do we have any industrial externalities? Uh, what I mean by that is here in Montreal, we have a canal which yes. for 300 years, the French Canadians have been building factories on, and it became so polluted with lead and mercury that uh, when, when we as army engineers were building a bridge over it, we dropped a tool into it. Transport Canada ministry told us not to recover the tool. They didn't want us to disturb the bottom of it. In Alaska, do you have, uh, uh, you know, in, in, from previous decades and perhaps previous centuries, uh, mining companies that are no longer in existence that left slag that's got to be uh, dealt with on on a huge scale that's going to you know become a huge issue with with climate change yeah not only not in existence but still currently operating the red dog mine up here in alaska has a long um difficult history with that and it led in the fight to prevent the the proposed pebble mine in the south central alaska which was going to be uh, estimated to be the largest uh, copper mine in the world, uh, probably second largest gold mine in the world, and third largest like molybdenum or something. It was huge, absolutely huge. So the pressure was there 
from uh, the industrial side. Um, but on the opposing side, uh, they didn't have a lot of trouble bringing up the history of like you miners have not done well here in the past and and all these guarantees are super suspect um, but even with today's technology and better policies and behaviors it's still like you're only guaranteeing maybe 20 30 years of perfect behavior and and that may be so and at the end of the day uh, perhaps at the end of the life cycle you close things up and it's fine but we still don't know what happens if a major event happens in alaska and all that stuff gets flooded out and oh by the way the reason it was additionally so sensitive is because that will go straight into bristol bay which is the premier fishery on the planet um so that was a huge fight i don't think it's completely over but it's not winning and that's because we have not only past, but current current examples right now of, of that externality uh, fresh in our minds uh, as examples of why we don't want to do this stuff. And, and then you got Russia demonstrating constantly inland, like, you're really bad at this. Uh, here's what happens and why we shouldn't do this in the Arctic. And then you got different other related externalities. I've learned from uh, Christina Hendrickson, the, the Sami uh, council president of what she calls uh, green colonialism. These sort of benign efforts, seemingly benign efforts to develop alternative forms of energy and storage in traditional lands that would seem fine, like windmills and other non-carbon producing infrastructure that um, they haven't taken into account the indigenous perspective of we we don't want that on our lands because you're you're gonna you know you're gonna wipe out our reindeer reindeer herd food source and other things in, in these areas um and it's not as simple as like it's non-carbon producing it's it's got other effects and you're not talking to us about that and you're just assuming you can put up these clean forms of alternative energy with, and it'll be just happily accepted. And that's not the case. And she's like, this, and she coined the term, like this green colonialism has got to stop. Right. And, and there's better ways to do this. Um, so we don't even understand some of the negative externalities yet. <laughs> Oh, may I ask about? I mean, I, th I think you you must have recalled. I mean, given given our respective ages, the the Soviets dumping all their submarines in Novaya Zemlya with the reactors. I, I mean, I I had a conversation with a naval officer, gosh, twenty years ago, and said, you know, for you guys, it's not a problem. Someone detonates a nuclear weapon near a ship, you just get a lot of radioactive water and it dissipates. And they said, no, no. In fact, in fact, uh, U.S. warships have a Citadel system which sprays the radioactive material away. It's a high priority because. Uh, water, when it's radioactive, is highly radioactive, and it interferes with everything on the ship, and it's a major issue. So the Russians, I don't know how many submarines, they had 300 subs, of which half were nuclear, and they just parked them next to Novaya Zemlya. I don't know how many of them had reactors that were compromised, um, but it's, it, it was sort of cleaned up. I think you mentioned it in your talk, uh, of, you know, the, the investment the West did in, in cleaning that up. Um, is whatever happened to that? Was it ever detected, or was it were people not trying to detect it, or was it uh, just affecting the Norwegians? It was Norway led the way, obviously, because they were most concerned about if effects. So Russia fessed up to you know a certain amount of stuff they said they dumped a couple of uh, submarines. I think I said 14 reactors and like 70,000 barrels of waste or something. And we figure, okay, yeah, that's probably maybe half at that. Um, and then the, the discussion developed from that point on, okay, what do we really need to know? Like, what else is out there? And what happens if it gets compromised in terms of the reactor uh, containment being compromised? And what does that mean for radiation and uh, pollution in the waters? And, and the, enough authorities came together to reasonably... Um, explain that okay the chances for containment are like none like russia's containment systems are unbelievably good and it's just not feasible 
is so statistically low that any of those could be breached, um, that it would be an issue. But in the un, un, very unlikely case that it did happen, what would that mean? And, you know, some super smart people did some math and said, well, in the grand scheme of things, um, in comparison to all of the natural levels of uh, radiation, you know, in the waters, it would be absolutely minuscule and it would be a non-factor at the end of the day. Um, they're like, all right, that's good to know. And, and they're like, you know, we're still cleaning this up regardless, but just to diminish those alarming concerns, um, much different from on land. But yeah, it, you know, if this happened, uh, it wouldn't be quite as bad as people think. It's a small fraction of a percentage of the amount of, of natural ionization in the waters. And it's extremely unlikely those would be compromised. And we're like, okay, keep cleaning it up then. And we're like, good. So everyone seemed pretty decently happy there with that. And then focus that attention on the upper part of the Kola Peninsula, which is an absolute nightmare <laughs> that does need to be cleaned up. <laughs> that is a whole different case. Yeah, Canada was, um, I'm, I'm not, I, I don't want to say fortunate, but uh, we were trusted enough to help dismantle two of the Typhoon ballistic missile submarines. Nice. And um, the Russians allowed us to do it on television, which is, which is actually sort of uh, really neat as of about 20 years ago. Um, I, I mean, I ask, I, again, you know, sort of, sort of following, uh, you know, from the intermediate to the, to the upper range, California in 1800 had 400,000 First Nations and it had a quarter of a million Mexicans and Americans. Uh, uh, well, not Mexicans, rather Spanish. I get at the time Spanish, Spanish uh, Mexicans. Today, it's you know the tenth largest economy in the world. If it was an independent country, um, yeah. uh, what are the uh, the studies in terms of soil? I mean, Leila Maria did a survey on Canada, uh, Quebec, and Ontario, and unfortunately, as, as uh, climate effects are are going to basically expose the Canadian Shield, which is this rock. Uh, 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 not very good for farming, good for ranching, but essentially um, we're not, you know, th there's no magic opening up of, of, of huge amounts of arable land in Canada if, if it moves north. For Alaska, what are the, I mean, I, I, again, 200 years, California went from, you know, the population of, of my local town to being a, an economic superpower. Uh, what are the, the, the prospects for, for, for soil in Alaska with uh, climate change and the strategic long-term impacts, say, you know, 100 100 150 years from now yeah good question my uh my colleague alec bennett did some early work on this just to look at what's that potential uh and, and basically and what would it take to get to arable land and whatnot compared to what we have now in in, in short we're looking at 60 uh to 70 years plus before agriculture has sort of a, a means in alaska we don't we don't as a state we don't have a department of agriculture. I should tell you something right there. <laughs> we do have a little bit of agriculture in, in some areas. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty minimal. Like we, we import the vast amount of food here and the rest of it doesn't depend on arable land. So the studies have been developed though, in terms of like, okay, what's going to look like what at this pace and rate of climate change, what does that look like in terms of arable land? And a lot of that depends on, all right, permafrost thaw, we got to understand permafrost thaw rates uh, very effectively in, in temperatures and when does the active layer stop being active and then permafrost sort of is done and cryoturbation happens and, and you got the soils that are amenable. However, they're going to significantly lack some of the other nutrients. Uh, so once you start seeing flora and fauna move north, right? And then you, you see the normal cycles uh, of all the nutrients, you know, nitrogen, especially being able to be reintroduced into soils. I think it's where the studies are showing, okay, we're a long ways away from that. And you're not, you're not arable land agriculturally until then. So the key to that for us, I think, is just watching the northern movement of flora and then naturally fauna uh, to, to be able to predict any of that. And none of that looks like anything sooner than seven, eight decades. Okay, no, yeah, but you know, it, it, of course, um, you know, it it is quite a ways off, and it's not our issue. It's going to be uh, our children, yeah. our grandchildren. But it's uh, the U.S. bought Alaska in 1860, I think, not or say 1867, not anticipating necessarily the, the strategic impact, but just with the, the 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 same instinct as Catherine the Great when Russia occupied the Far East, which is uh, we want to hold this. We need to conquer 
uh, people, and that's going to have a long-term, you know, effect because those people are eventually going to politicize and go, we don't want to be, you know, a part of this uh, enterprise anymore. You can see that with, you know, uh, Putin's war in Ukraine right now. Um, that's what, it didn't happen to us though. 1867, when the U.S. bought this, uh, it wasn't even a territory then. It was just considered a district. Um, you know, that all happened. Good to go. You get to, uh, you know, 60 eight and arco discovers is you know the largest petroleum reserve in the united states up there in the north slope and they get super excited about developing the means to get it to market and there's no example in the world so they're studying everything and they land on the pipeline and they start laying out the pipeline throughout alaska and indigenous peoples and representatives said um what are you doing that's our land they're like whatever go away they're like no that's our land you can't do this they didn't want to listen. So right to Congress and said, uh, so we got a problem. And, you know, some clever lawyer, probably deep in a dungeon somewhere said, um, actually, they're right. In accordance with international law, you bought Alaska back in 1867. However, the indigenous peoples hadn't been conquered. Thus, they're still sovereign. Thus, it's their land. Stop everything. And uh, Secretary of Interior banned and put everything on pause. And then industry got really concerned on how to resolve this as fast as possible. In 1971, pay, passed the um, Alaska Native Settlement Claim Act. Thanks, go. 1971 went quickly just because of that. That one little thing someone discovered, ooh, Alaska peoples weren't conquered. And it changed everything. That's yeah, fascinating. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, obviously the rules do matter because it's the whole yes. basis for the legitimacy of political system. And if you start playing fast and loose, then you're just going to create a, you know, a problem for the future when people do become uh, uh, politically organized. Sorry, can, can I ask you a question about legacy? Yeah. Um, I know, again, this is, uh, uh, is there, um, we, we know whales, for example, we know some whales uh, have lived for over 100 years and they definitely remember the whalers. Um, and we, um, I, I think people suppose it because the whales avoid, you know, the, the whales avoid ships, but also because they found harpoons in these whales, uh, oh. whales that are over 100 years old. Americans were uh, some of the most aggressive whalers of the 19th century. And I, I know we, we last used whale oil in 1971 in, in the Chevrolet steering column, right? So that's quite recent because <laughs> it's, it's just chemically, it's, it's almost impossible to be produced. You, there was an American mayor of the city of Petropavlos. And, you know, the, the, the foundational stories of the Australians are American whalers raiding the Australian coast. As far as, you know, the, the Falkland Islands was largely dispossessed from the Argentinians by American whalers who then created space for the English. Uh, is there any memory in the region of this sort of hegemonic American Arctic behavior from a century ago? The whales remember, but do the people remember? And does that have an effect or has it been completely forgotten? It's not, it's not forgotten. I don't think it's well known. Uh, but it'll surface sometimes in the form of just trivia. So I ask people, okay. where were the last shots fired in the U.S. Civil War? And I like, ah, somewhere in Alabama, maybe, perhaps Georgia. Like, nope, it was in the Arctic, in the high barren sea, just like you said, the Petropavlos. That's where the last shots were fired. And I'm like, what? And they're like, yeah. So a little bit of trivia and history for you. You know, the the... Confederate States, CSS, uh, understood that one of the main ways for the Union military to sustain itself was through the power of, you know, the shipping industry related shipping, which wasn't huge, uh, but it was enough. Uh, and back in the day, it made its way to uh, the ship called the CSS Shenandoah made its way to Australia or New Zealand, refitted and pumped its way up to the north because it knew if it could cut off whaling oil and other things like that, it could gain an upper hand. Uh, so it did, and it got up and it decimated this whaling fleet of like 14 ships. And I think it captured 11, took out three or four. Um, but it did this in uh, July, late June, July of 1865. Wow. And anyone that knows the history realizes that's four months after the end of the Civil War. And that's there's a reason for that. The word did not get to the CSS Shenandoah crew and the can, uh, captain uh, that the war was over and they were charging on as if. And uh, 
in the last shots uh, of the U.S. Civil War in the Arctic up there in the Bering Sea, just where you said, uh, and was on a whaling fleet, and it just wiped it out. <laughs> so, I, now I think I think I mean you're you're highlighting the fact that uh, really Alaska is a part of a separate, uh, not a separate, but it has its own distinct ecological oh, yeah. political environment that you know you can't exclude. Uh, you know the, the 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 North Pacific, either east or west, in understanding what happened. Um, I think ten years before uh, uh, your account, the British Navy uh, attempted to seize Petropavlovsk and failed. And before the U.S. Uh, purchased Alaska, the U.S. Navy um, right. uh, during the Crimean War, Crimean uh, War yeah. uh, conducted patrols along the uh, the Aleutians looking for Russian uh, bases. And so. Alaska has been, a, you know, a strategic location, um, uh, you know, certainly <laughs> for more than 100 years. Um, that action, I that that action, those British ships in the Crimean War and the hate for Queen Victoria at the time from Russia was the reason Russia sh chose the United States to sell because the Hudson Bay Company was charging across and we're basically at the west coast there in, in now British Columbia as U.S. miners, uh, gold miners were on the west coast in San Francisco moving north. Both were going to move north. Both were basically, if they wanted, could take over uh, what is now Alaska from Russia. And Russia had no plans to be able to defend this stuff, right? They're broken and crippled from Crimea War. And Russia had two, you know, two main actors on who wanted it and who they could probably sell it to. And because of the Crimea War and all that stuff the British did, Russia's like, yeah, go away. We're going to go with America. And that's how we ended up, largely how we ended up with Alaska. <laughs> no, it, it, uh, yeah, obviously um, things happening very far away in Moscow had an, an effect yeah. uh, in the region. Uh, if I can, you know, I've, I've asked so many questions. I just have two right. last big strategic questions. I'll, I'll, ask, I'll ask both of them. Um, I, I, these are highly speculative. We don't have to answer them, obviously. Um, the first one is, uh, you know, you, you have a great experience in the Arctic. What are the implications for Antarctic? I mean, you must see that there, there's, there's no transpositions. I flew from Montreal to Beijing, and it, the path goes directly over the Arctic. And so I looked it up, and, um, you know, Canada's got a search and rescue team able to deal with that. Um, Australia and Argentina chose not to have a trans-Antarctic flight because they couldn't do search and rescue if a plane went down, even though it would go down on land and not, not, not uh, in the oceans. Um, with climate change, Antarctica, it, it, we, we, they have confirmed mining interests. And we don't, you know, mining is expensive in the Arctic, but depends what you're mining. And, and we do have remote mining stations in Canada. So, uh, you know, what applies, what applies in so many ways to the Arctic can apply to Antarctica. And, you know, the, again, 1950s and 60s, I think there was a lot more there because the Soviets had a very large research station. China's there now. Now, maybe they're not about to mine, but um, I, I think a, a lot of a lot of what you study, I, I know, applies perfectly um, well there. Uh, and the other issue is, um, I'm asking at the, sort of the, at the same time, uh, because they might be might be related. Uh, it's, it's, again, it sounds a bit a bit bizarre, but my my reserve regiment, uh, one of the squadrons intervened in Vladivostok in 1918 during the Russian Civil War, uh, 14th, uh, 16th Field Company. And of course, the Americans were there as well as the Japanese. And the Japanese marched all the way up to Lake uh, Irkutsk, uh, rather, mm -hmm. rather Lake Baikal next to Irkutsk. Okay. And um, this could happen again. And, uh, you know, while Japan is likely to be um, you know, for any intervention, if China were to go for Siberia, the political choice would have to be made. Do we allow China to, to, to occupy the Russian Far East? Uh, Japan is, you know, it's locally, uh, you know, if, if Japan is sympathetic, it's it's close by. It would probably be the staging area. But Alaska is the depth, right? Um, there's nothing, there's no other real estate there. You, it would probably be the closest bit of infrastructure uh, to deal with that. And mm -hmm. again, you know, forgive me for sort of speculating. My job, I do a lot of war gaming, so I speculate okay. constantly. And I wrote, I wrote something, I published something on this. Um, I think it was the national interest warning people mm -hmm. that they have to think about this because, um, you know, uh, some people thought Rhodesia, which is essentially a, a state defined by a privilege of, you know, one ethnicity, would last forever. It lasted 14 years, and then it folded, right? Uh, the Far East is not necessarily secure. And I'm not saying the Chinese necessarily want to go north. I mean, you'd have the geriatric Russian population dealing with the geriatric Chinese population. So maybe no one wants to go there, right? Maybe it's, it's doomed to depopulation, and then the local uh, Yakut people are going to, you know, get more um, self-representation. But So what are your... 
thoughts on those two giant uh, big strategic issues? You know, I think with the Antarctic, it has provided us the very effective alternative opposite way to understand why the arctic is so important i think long-term interests there are, are a bit dynamic right now and presence has been a very important learning uh, aspect of antarctic why are all the nations there in maintaining a population right that tells us a lot about like the montevideo convention and the importance of presence in terms of that component of sovereignty becomes huge no idea what that means for antarctic but it did have a huge effect on the Arctic when the, uh, in 2007, when Russia had planted that flag, everyone's like, what? what does that mean? It's like, we're like, it's the same as the US planting a flag on the moon. Stop thinking about it, right? But that didn't end the conversation, obviously. And uh, there were calls right after that because there's so many concerns uh, of establishing an Antarctic-like treaty for the Arctic. And uh, in 2008, and it started picking up in, in 2009, and you see the media doing its media thing, uh, uh, sort of accelerating and magnifying these weird discussions. And uh, we're like, well, that can't happen. Um, if you just look at a map, it's a ridiculous notion. Um, besides, no, it ain't happening look at this geography and geography will tell you a lot I always start with maps because it's very helpful right the the antarctic is a is a is a land mass surrounded by waters and nobody owns that land mass right and the arctic is water mass surrounded by sovereign lands you have you have literally the opposite of what's going on down south that tells you right away you can't do an antarctic like anything in the arctic it's opposite day, all right, for literally and figuratively. <laughs> so, but the concern was there about this discussion, this talk, like, no, 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 no. So the Arctic Five, who have sovereign jurisdictions in uh, the Arctic, maritime and otherwise, um, got together and said, uh, we're putting this one to bed now. Went to Ilulisat, Greenland, and signed a declaration that said, we will only consider issues related to sovereignty in the arctic through the un convention on law of the sea that's it stop talking about the rest of this stuff period that was a loud message deliberately to the world and you know to the demise of, of the sensitivities of uh iceland and in finland and sweden who weren't invited but that also signaled something really important, which was, oh, I see where we stand, right? The Arctic Eight, however. But um, then they came back together again and uh, after that signing in 2010, in 2012, and I think 2014, and signed it again. Uh, so what we learned from Antarctica was that, first and foremost, was um, that's not how stuff works. That's not how sovereignty works. Um, and that's that's going to always be the leading national security priority of any nation. You'll see it in the policies and you'll see it in behavior. So uh, beyond that, I don't pay attention much to Antarctica because it's it's so distracting and different that, okay, besides Shackleton, which that whole thing is just unbelievable. Uh, I really hope someday they make awesome movies of that. Um, but you know how... It's just amazing. Uh, and the finding the ship recently too, just uh, just stunning. You know, not unlike the the terror and the uh, and uh, what's the other one? In, the Franklin. Yeah, the Franklin expedition, the terror and the Airbus up in the north. Yep, amazing to find those. Very important geopolitically, uh, too. Obviously, we saw that from Harper mm -hmm. uh, claiming victory immediately on that. Wait, it's like. Those are British ships, so are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> fun stuff. They're like, no, no, we bought all that. Okay, fine. Have fun with that. Um, but how each nation has maintained such a consistent and notable presence in the Antarctic, that's where, you know, I, I think our, our thinking should go. And then there's a lot of people who are experts. I'd point you to like Liz Buchanan out of Australia, who is just 
she is super smart on both and uh, and she could definitely uh, inform us on like what are the connections and she's trying to get me to write stuff on that and I'm like I don't know enough about Antarctica <laughs> it sounds appealing but um yeah uh I I look at that I don't even understand it. and I hear about this thing about this Antarctic treaty that might be sunsetting I don't know what that means yet uh, it seems to get a lot of people excited then I listen to the experts are like it's nothing it's not how it works and I, I'm going with them but I don't know how and why <laughs> Uh, uh, I, 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 I don't want to get history from Hollywood, but um, I yeah. mean, one of the issues of, of the Arctic, especially Alaska, is, you know, you might recall there was a, a World War III movie in the 1970s or 80s. It's it, it's essentially such a difficult environment to police that if a country had an incentive to provoke a small incident um, where, you know, you, sort of hybrid warfare, I think this, I can't, again, I can't remember the name of the movie, but it started with a Russian patrol sneaking into Alaska and blowing up an electrical station. That's the yeah. kind of thing you can't have in Central Europe Cold War. You, you're not going to have that uh, even between Taiwan and China because it's it's so surveilled. Um, but uh, it, it, you know, for for the purposes of signaling, um, you're on the edge of the state's ability to enforce its territorial sovereignty, and okay. and, and an adversary could exploit it. I mean, you're you're on you're basically in the least defensive part of of the U.S. And so there's you know sort of that sub hybrid warfare uh, concern. Yeah, we're that that concerns us but dream, you know thinking and imagining those scenarios is is just as bizarre as like the reality like who would do that it's like wait russia you're putting up all this defensive bastion infrastructure along the northern coast to protect your natural resources as if someone's going to sneak in here and steal your oil like how does this work and, and these scenarios are just wild but they happen um and and they are they're they tend to be most extreme most creative uh but at, at the end of the day what's really important is just being able to demonstrate the ability to respond to that uh and then we do have some real concerns like okay you got to protect infrastructure and that's just part of a normal formula and operational requirements but um it's hard to imagine the scenarios but when I have to explain the stuff to folks like in DC in the lower 48, it's, it's like, we don't wait until that happens to learn how to do it. Right. We have got to plan for all scenarios. That's how the world of defense works. That's how national defense works. Um, you, you have to be prepared and, and that's what we focus on, but then there's other, you know, intermediate stuff where a lot of the stuff really relies on most extreme scenario thinking. And that's fine. And as long as you keep that aware and develop it under those pretenses, that's fine. You're not pushing that as like, this should be the priority. It just needs to be there in your thinking, just like, you know, nuclear, whatever. It's it's most extreme, but you got to keep it there in your mind and thinking, right? Um, it's all the intermediate stuff that really concerns us security wise. That's, and that stuff's hard to imagine also, but we do like, I've gotten a question before, like, Okay, like in Canada and same thing in the United States and Alaska, you, you just can't sneak in and then hang out in a village and go unnoticed. There is no such thing, <laughs> right? There is no such thing as hiding in a village, right? That happened in Canada, right? I think in, was it Old Crow during COVID when that couple showed up? They're like, well, what are you doing here, right? Uh, it's same thing here. Like you cannot hide in a village. Um so in in the rangers are taught like hey you start seeing things you see a blueprint that doesn't even look right you know canadian rangers know to report that stuff okay there might be activities but we do know stuff might happen we do know that there are times that may be uh there might be exploitable like during a, a disaster and a disaster response now when you have lots of people flooding in to help with the response effort and they're not locals, right? That's a really good time to just blend in and maybe collect and maybe cause problems, maybe prepare to blow up something, whatever, right? So we do have to stay vigilant and creative. And that's difficult for the lower 48 to do who can't imagine the Arctic in the first place, let alone experience it. And then pack on like semi-plausible, you know, scenarios. It's 
it's sometimes it's painful to talk to lower 48 for us. Yeah, no, you have to forgive me, uh, uh, my, you know, I'm paid to be paranoid, but it, it, to, to, um, to, to give a little bit of trust to, to Russian contingency planning, the Germans did have 100,000 soldiers trying to take Murmansk in the Second World War, which was uh, completely unprecedented. Um, and they had a quarter of a million soldiers in Norway. And, you know, yep. the Russians have been saying we must defend Murmansk. Murmansk had never been attacked. I mean, aside from Churchill landing a couple of Brits during yep. the Russian Civil War. So bizarre things do happen. And in Canada, the Germans put a, uh, a weather station in Labrador, which was discovered in the 1970s. Uh, and it's now in our museum. So, right. uh, so they would get you know preliminary uh, alerts to the weather uh, that would affect their wolf packs chasing our convoys in the Atlantic. So, um, you know, uh, policing uh, large areas, uh, you definitely have to have a good relations with the, the the local First Nations who you know who know who know how to that, see things in the land. That right? stuff's still vital. So today, that still matters. The number one and most important place for Russia in in the Arctic right above Europe in, in Asia, all the way from the Bering Strait to all the way around Norway, the most important place for them uh, strategically is uh, the Bering Sea right above Norway, right? So that protection of Murmansk is still absolutely critical, the number one priority for them, right? That is a maritime boundary, as an operational boundary that cannot be compromised. You got the epicenter of everything Russia North in Murmansk. I mean, it's its nuclear manufacturing servicing center. It's the Joint Command Headquarters. It's the Northern Fleet Headquarters. It's got three major ports there. It's got the most population of the rest of the Russian Arctic. Um, it's, it's vital. It's absolutely vital. So that maritime boundary right there between Norway and the Barents Sea and Russia is still just as important and mainly for two reasons, right? And their behaviors show this and we know this. Um, and it, what it, it's what keeps that Barents Sea, that part, uh, extremely competitive as it was before and is still now and probably more so in terms of the first reason is nothing can be allowed to, to be able to uh, encroach and cross that maritime line without permission, right? There can, that is a huge threat to Russia and reasonably so. Right. That's just geography. And that's all kinds of stuff that tells you they have got to protect that. Any nation would do that. Any nation. Um, so what that means is that bastion defense, that layer outside of that maritime boundary is an outside secondary layer of defense as part of the huge bastion defense of the north where they will. Right. Deterrence in that relatively small amount of area has a different meaning for Russia. Uh, for for those two reasons, one, not being allowed to cross into and having control and defense of, of that maritime boundary, and two, not allowing the West to impact its ability of freedom of maneuver to the North Atlantic, absolutely vital, right? So that area right above Europe is, is probably more important than a lot of people realize operationally. Um, and that's, you know, the history of this. You know, Petsamo uh, Turkina's operation is is uh, will tell you a lot, uh, and and those are places where you can look at scenarios a lot more easier than you can in some cases up here in the North American Arctic. Yeah, I'm I'm going to ask one last question. Uh, you, I mean, just absolutely a, a sort of fountain of information. Um, the first Anglo-Dutch war started because the English, with their new navy, were, were asking the Dutch to pay some sort of toll to fish in the North Sea. You mentioned before, with something which I did not know, about the important fishing grounds uh, off the coast of Alaska. Uh, I, and again, this is speculative. Is there, uh, is there the possibility of engaging in economic warfare uh, um, against fisheries. I know that it's sort of peculiar. Can can a country deliberately ruin a fisheries for someone else? I know that China is the biggest fishing nation in the world. I know that, uh, I mean, they're remarkably productive because I think half of their fish are actually aquaculture on rivers within China. But even mm -hmm. given the scale of the fishing in China, China does not have enough food, um, uh, rivers and right. land combined to feed itself. So for China, it's right. grand strategy. Obviously, no Western country is going to destroy fisheries deliberately. It's illegal. But um, countries could conceivably engage in economic warfare. Can, can countries oh, yeah. ruin fisheries deliberately? Yeah, but not in the Arctic. I think so much attention 
and efforts been paid in the Arctic very effectively that it's it's going to be extremely difficult for that to happen. Um, a couple, there's a few examples of why there's, there's actually plenty of evidence. Um, one, that Bering Sea fishery it provides, I think, at least 25% of the fish to the rest of the United States. Most of our fish, it's, it's a world-class, unbelievable natural salmon habitat that is just vital to us. Uh, it's amazing. It's it's unbelievable. And, you know, equally, the Barents Sea fisheries, too, is also incredibly important, too. So these are two areas, the premier areas that are Arctic related, and both extremely well protected uh, and under different threats, perhaps, right? China being one of the main ones. The one, the Barents Sea fisheries has got a really interesting history and and you'll never know learn more about how to deal with russia than understanding it through finnish experience and norwegian experience these are the two people uh i i talk to when i need to know something and um norway has a long uh storied history with russia in terms of managing the barren sea fisheries through the cold war and uh and, and now, even up to now, uh, it's a world-class fishery up there, and they understand the importance of it. For Russia, in, in Norway, like many other things with Russia, works very hard to, in, in does the, you know, the lion's share of the work to manage issues with Russia in its north. And, and the fisheries was the same way. Throughout the Cold War, they would have uh, annual meetings, if not biannual, in terms of understanding and learning how to manage fisheries and why. For Russia, it was a numbers game. It was food. It was feed the Soviet population, right? And they came to good terms and management, relatively, with Norway uh, in understanding, hey, don't if you decimate the population, you're out, right? We're all screwed. We can't do that, right? So things improved and, and largely was managed well uh, through Norwegian expertise and, and experience. Um, and then when the Cold War ended, they were right there also to help them change because now it wasn't a numbers game. It wasn't food. It was, it was capitalization. How to learn about fisheries for capitalization purposes. And Norway was right there to teach them that too transform management but it was still basically some of the same biology and they did and it's been phenomenal they work very very well together sometimes there's a little bit of back and forth just a flex but nothing crisis wise uh, and china doesn't play up there right they don't they know not to go up there right these are two nations you don't mess with uh bering sea a little bit different a little closer access and uh, the circumstances are a bit easier for them to take advantage of. So we have a tremendous issue in the, in the, in the world with IUU fishing, we call it, is illegal, unreported, un, unregulated fishing. China is probably the leading problem with this. And, and they uh, constantly do this up in, in the Bering Sea also. And the way they do this is they basically, one of their main abilities to achieve its goals around the world it, from what i've noticed is to just basically overwhelm the system and i've noticed it's any system any system they want they got enough people on this planet to inject into that problem and overwhelm it right so they did that in uh vancouver uh, which you all know very well they destroyed the real estate market in vancouver by just simply overwhelming the system Right? They do this all over. They try to do this, their Pacific and African strategies, right? They bring in, um, they bring in their own workforce and they overwhelm the system and they, they constantly have the advantage uh, as a result. They do the same thing with IUU fishing. They have massive numbers of fishing boats that they bring in, these fleets of fishing boats. And they understand that we only have a couple of, you know, Coast Guard assets that can effectively be there for law enforcement. Right. So they know exactly how this works. They bring in a fleet of hundreds, if not thousands of boats, and they know where they're supposed to be and at what time for fishing management purposes. And they do. And they're there. And we're watching them like anyone else. And then the fishing begins. It's crazy. There's all kinds of actors. And then they know how to peel off a couple. 
to go do that IUU illegal version of phishing. And they know that will overwhelm the system often very, very quickly, right? But China's already factored that in, in terms of like, okay, we can risk and sacrifice 10 boats, but the other 30 or 50 will get away. Net net gain for us, right? They're like, that's, that's normal for them. Um, and they know we can't handle that because they can overwhelm the system. Coast Guard's changed its strategy since then, right? And it's actually become a little more difficult to actually fish up there because we're having a difficulty uh, tracking fish like we used to be able to. So that's changed things too. Um, and now China's focused, I think, elsewhere off of South, Af uh, South America, perhaps. But we banned fishing in the U.S. Arctic waters since 2012, effectively. And that was pretty comprehensive. Everyone's okay with that maintaining subsistence rights and then the central arctic ocean ban has been in effect and china signed on to that and i think largely because there's not a lot of hope for fishing in that high north anyway so that's a huge success story and i think besides the bering sea which you know experiences a bit of iu fishing the rest of the arctic i think is in pretty good shape and well managed um and I think we're seeing IEU fishing um, a little more concentrated elsewhere. Uh, I don't know about Canadian waters necessarily, but I don't think Canada's messing around there too much. So uh, China's, like you said, um, they got the largest population on the planet. They need to feed it and they need energy. Yeah, I think right. it's I think it's as dynamic as you describe it. I was watching a, a, a YouTube. I watch a lot of the YouTube by Russian local Russians, the ones that have stayed behind. And yeah. there was one, gosh, six months ago, who was uh, doing a, a, a sort of a video a video trip to Vladivostok and going up the coast. And there are abandoned fishing stations uh, up up north of Vladivostok, which you know indicated that these. I mean, there, there's rapid ecological change um, that the industry can barely uh, keep up with. So I mean. Um, uh, clearly, this climate change is having a huge effect. I mean, on you know, on an enormous scale. Um, you, you, again, sort of silly anecdotal, but um, you know, I'm not I'm not an expert, but I, I see the National Geographic map that shows the illumination at night of the Earth, and the illumination of the oceans by fishing vessels is almost the same as the, the humans living on land lighting up their cities at night. I mean, this, the industrial scale of fishing is is insane, and it's. It sort of boggles the mind that we don't have a single treaty dealing with areas, uh, you know, comprehensively outside the exclusive economic zone. That's, it seems like a pill for disaster. That's the, you, you know, you, that you're right on point with that, right? And that's, this, this explains the primary issue with this and why the Coast Guard has changed its strategy. So it has an IEU fishing strategy out, um, new one as of about three years ago. And line of effort number two, what I was talking about there earlier, uh, is helping to build um, a, something of a geopolitical case because Coast Guard's out there doing what it can with a, a few assets and it can't take on the overwhelming amount of, of uh, Chinese assets. So I always ask people this, who, who, who are frustrated with this issue, and don't quite get it. And I'm like, here's a good place for you to start. Explain to me why there's no sanctions against China for this behavior. And they can't. And I'm like, when you can explain that, you'll understand what's actually going on. And at the root of the cause is, this isn't actually something we can, we can define as China, the nation state in doing. We can't do that. There is nothing out there that says this is state sanctioned. This is a behavior that the regime is endorsed in backing, right? There's nothing to that extent that exists. All these boats are basically to China. What we have to consider them, these are sub-state actors. These are basically just criminals. This is nothing official. Therefore, our ability for GAC or State Department to go to China and say, you're sanctioned now, it doesn't exist. These are basically just criminals. And China's like, I don't know. It's not me. It's not us. So Coast Guard, sick of this stuff. We're like, we can't keep doing this. So we're going to work to build a case where we do pin this on the nation state of China. And then we can do this treaty stuff or we can do this sanctions and, and, and manage this a little bit better. Maybe get to a treaty, like you said. 
but I don't think people realize how difficult this this uh, issue actually is. Yeah, I think 30 years ago, Taiwan had an issue. Uh, they found that a lot of the pirates in the South China Sea were were uh, off season People's Liberation Army Navy people. And uh, now and it, it, it's not it wasn't you know a, an overwhelming practice, but some individuals are engaging in piracy in the South China Sea um, and the Chinese government probably in select cases knew. Um, and I don't know what caused it to end. I think it was just the, the threat of Taiwanese uh, retaliation. And there's a, there a high profile case of a couple of deaths um, in private uh, sh uh, ships that occurred. Uh, that was a long time ago. I, I think I think obviously the the collapse of the Somali state and the issues of mm -hmm. piracy around the um, the Malacca Strait led to an international, obviously a, a much greater international awareness of policing the high seas. That was, yeah, that was uh, Admiral Stavridis. He was the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe. Back then, your US UCOM commander, he put together the anti-piracy coalition, which involved Russia. It involved Iran. It involved all of NATO. It's an example of like, when you really want to get something done, right? And, and that's one thing we know about the world's oceans. Uh, there are certain things that are taboo, like you don't do piracy. Like this world runs and depends on the world's oceans working and maritime enterprise being extremely stable. So piracy is 100% unacceptable. Fine, you want to do it. There's no place on this planet you can hide because look at this team we got. And they did. They got to the Strait of Malacca and elsewhere and they crushed it. And it's an example of uh, like how important this is. And maybe, you know, maybe this can be used again, but it's it's an interesting uh you know example of like when we really want to do stuff like fix the ozone layer fix piracy yeah it's, it's curious done. that uh it, it, some things are tolerated but um the u.s yeah. does not tolerate other countries printing american currency so there clearly <laughs> are severe red lines and piracies listed there other yes, things sir. are negotiable but uh, sure. uh, you know there there are those you know instant trigger uh, issues. But of course, in defense of the Somalis, uh, I think the conventional wisdom is, however bad piracy was, I mean it, it was it it started with um, large fishing companies coming off the the Somali coast and just deep netting north south. That's, so that's why that's why we're a state. That's why Alaska is a state. That's what broke the straw on the camel's back. That was that was then I think. Um, intern to the senate or or lawyer uh, senator stevens ted stevens back then uh dealing with the fact that all of these fishing companies are coming up here setting up fish traps and just dis decimating our way of life our primary resource uh revenue um and we can't do anything about it because we're only a territory that is a thing that propelled us to actually being accepted as a state or Oh, fascinating. So Leila Maria, uh, uh, you know, thank you, Professor Bupart. Holy cow. Uh, is a long, a long question and answer. Leila Maria. Um, I have no more questions left. <laughs> so gotcha. both have been answered. But thank you yeah. very, very, very much. Super informative. Uh, it's fun always. Uh, this this will happen anywhere, anytime. You want to talk about the Arctic? How much time we got? Because you know, I, I love this stuff, and I, I see we're going in good directions. Love working with Canada, uh, and uh, the Arctic E talks will be starting up again in January, because um, we really want to have you know more of these high level discussions, and especially now, see what's going on. Um, so I think first up on the January twenty fifth, we have Lieutenant General Odlo, Joint Commander of the Norwegian um, Joint Command. And, uh, may, may I ask, uh, sort of related to that one, one very last question, what are your, your uh, future research uh, interests? Where do you think uh, you're going to go and where do you think um, uh, people should focus on in, in terms of Arctic security? Oh, that's a good one. Uh, <laughs> so what I am working on right now is a shift in responding to the changes of the Arctic and Russia's behavior and what to expect. And uh, this has been difficult couple of things going on. One, I'm working very closely with 11th Airborne Division because it's such a huge part of the total combined uh, arms forces of our Arctic capabilities and DOD. And I'm using it as a few examples of how to understand this better and then how to get people to understand how difficult this is. And I'm hoping this will translate well to Canada someday that I can talk with um, you know, JTF North and 
and, and CJOC and DND and DRDC and say, we are going through tremendous transformational issues. And I think some of this could be valuable to you and the land forces of the Canadian Armed Forces. We'd love to share this. Um, we're hoping to get there. So that is a huge priority of mine right now. Um, and at the same time, uh, I want, there's, there's, there's significant concerns with uh, US UCOM and NORTHCOM and uh, a little bit of Indo PACOM on terms of what do we need to do with the Arctic and what's going on now? What do we need to know about Russia and its behavior in Ukraine and what are going to be the impacts? What does that mean for us? Um, so, without having done all of the homework, um, you know, at this at this point, I can only basically guarantee to some extent Russia's ability to continue its Russian strategic Arctic developments, as it has in the past, as it has stated, as it's kind of continuing now, is going to be impacted by what will result in all the sanctions during and post Ukraine. It's going to suffer somehow, some way. Um, Russia as a whole state, it, it is a priority, but they're going to be impacted. And that impact means that this is an opportunity for us in the West and the United States and elsewhere to close some important gaps. Russia has significant military capabilities in the North. They got in ahead of us. This is our chance to close those gaps. And I sincerely hope we take this opportunity that we will probably never get again uh, and, and, and jump on this. So I got a lot of interest in this right now as far as a strategic U.S. objective and possibly an allied objective. But um, I think everyone sees the value in it. Uh, and that's that's a that's more than enough to keep me busy, because if it works, it, it would be really important to me, I think, in, in us uh, as allies um, to, to take that, commit to it and move forward. So I'm putting a lot of effort into that. Well, thank you very much, Professor Troy Bouchard. We're privileged to have, uh, you know, a scholar with the, with the boots on the ground in beautiful Alaska, uh, sharing with us, you know, what, you know, clearly one of the pivotal uh, regions of the world. Uh, Leila Maria. Yeah, and I'm going to thank you again for just coming and then uh, for the information. It was usually most of the information I get from the Arctic is through the Arctic Etox, funny enough. I attend them and then I just take as much as I can because on field versus what you see in papers, there's a lot of um, substantial difference between what's being said and what's being written. It's it's difficult. You know, we, we recognize the value and we created the Etox out of an interesting opportunity and necessity. And I understand the difference between experts like us talking about the Arctic and then getting getting the insights, the critical insight from the elite level, right? Those are the decision makers at the higher levels. And we all need to be thinking and we're, we're, we should be closely connected in our understandings and, and our dialogue and, and so on and so forth, right? It's, it's critical, but there's, like you said, there's huge difference between the expert community we're all over the place sometimes uh, in, in that elite level, right? Uh, and that's what we want the e-talks to be like, hey, we want the right person talking about the right topic. And it has turned into such a, an amazing series for us, so much so that when Ukraine hit, DODs like at the same time they stopped, they said, what are you guys doing with this e-talks thing? Because not all of DOD was tracking it. We were doing it out of sort of COVID boredom at first. And it became very successful at very high levels that DOD is like, what are you guys doing? We're like, okay, it's, that's great. Um, let's make this official. So we finished doing uh, the con op. It's been blessed off by all the command and leadership. And it's official now. And and uh, we are kicking it back on in January. So we must have done something right. And I miss bringing this to everybody. Uh, so I look forward to it.